and tomorrow is really, in the world of public health, probably the best form of primary prevention uh, possible or plausible. So let's start with some of the hype. Um, and I know some of you might have been quoted in some of these articles, uh, myself among them, by the way. Uh, and I will, will say that this is just a tiny fraction of the amount of hype uh, that is out there where, where folks are publishing stories in magazines with claims of extraordinary increases in longevity, either already here or on the horizon. Um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the title, by the way. Often the titles are exaggerated by the authors in order to bring readers in, and then there's usually some good information con uh, contained within there. But I will say that there's an incredible amount of exaggeration. But one of the worst examples is the upper right-hand corner from uh, Prudential. Uh, and I, I gave a talk not long ago with the CEO of Prudential in the audience where I, it came down on him like a ton of bricks. And I said, you don't have to exaggerate. That's the first 150-year-old is here. You know, aging, there's plenty of aging to go around. It's, you don't need, you don't need to, to, to exaggerate in order to support your, your line of reasoning. This is, is perhaps one of the, the culprits of um, these no, some of these notions of uh, radical life extension, or at least life expectancies of 100 predicted sometime within this uh, century. And it's all based on linear extrapolation. So if you take historical trends and record life expectancy, you plot them out, you extend them out into the future using straight line linear extrapolation. You, it's easy to do. Anybody can draw a line. Uh, and drawing lines will lead, in my view, to these unrealistically high estimates of life expectancy. And I'll explain why it is that I think this is not likely to happen anytime soon. So communicating why there are limits uh, and what those limits might be is not always an easy thing to do. So I try different approaches. So I'm going to try them all on you today. There'll, there'll be abbreviated versions, but I'm going to try them all. So the first one, well, let's start with data. I mean, data sometimes is a really good use. It's a useful thing to use. Is indeed life expectancy rising uh, for two and a half years per decade, as some have, have predicted in the past? Well, uh, not in the US. Short answer is no. Uh, actually, it's, you know, you have seen some historical increases of uh, anywhere from one and a half to two, on occasion, two and a half years, but in fact, the rise in life expectancy has, has decelerated, uh, and in some places it's actually reversed. We're probably one of the worst off countries, the United States, uh, showing that the uh, annual rate of improvement uh, is almost zero now, since 2010. Uh, it's, it's extremely low, but guess what? It's not just the United States. Here's Canada. The far, the far right line, by the way, is the rate of improvement that we've seen uh, in life expectancy at birth just from the year 2010. And you can see pretty much across the globe, here's the UK, uh, a pretty dramatic deceleration in the rate of improvement since 2010. Here's Israel. Uh, so the rate of improvement in life expectancy in Israel has gone down. I could go on and on. This is a, a, a phenomenon that's happening across the globe. So while we're working really hard to influence the rate of aging, what's happening in the real world is the rate of improvement is decelerated. Uh, in some cases, it's actually reversed. That's the reality. Speak as, we, as much as we want about radical increases in life expectancy, the observed reality is not following the prediction of linear extrapolation. So can uh, human biology allow most of us to become centenarians? The short answer is no. I actually don't think that this is plausible based on anything that we can do today. Now, there's a long line of reasoning that, um, that we presented in this manuscript with, with my colleague Bruce Carnes and Len, Len Hayflick. I will just show you a couple of images that illustrates some of this line of reasoning which you've seen. These are basically some of the things that happen to human bodies uh, when we get older. I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, on any of this, since you're going to hear some of this perhaps a bit uh, later today, but you will see age-related changes that are occurring in the human body. And look, granted, we're going to get better and better at replacing body parts. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll be replacing hips and knees and influencing muscle mass and bone density and lots of interventions will have some impact. Uh, but here is the Achilles heel. 
uh, the human brain. And unless we can find a way to slow down or influence in some way uh, the aging brain, uh, it really doesn't matter in the, in the long run what we do to the rest of us, because this will stop us from achieving any sort of significant increases in life expectancy um, today. Uh, all right, so here's the second way in which I want to convey this, which is using Olympic records. Uh, I, I think I presented this when I was in, in Israel last, last October, so I'll be brief uh, on this. It's sort of interesting looking at, at uh, world records for Olympic events, and if you actually look at world records for Olympic events, you discover something rather interesting, and that is uh, these uh, world records have slowed down quite dramatically. In fact, we're not really expecting much of an increase in world records for just about anything in Olympics. How far you can throw something, how fast you can run, how fast you can skate. We're running up against the limit. Uh, I were, I'm actually writing a paper on peak, uh, peak longevity, which I haven't completed yet, uh, but it relates to this concept of peak Olympics. Uh, so if you look at uh, plateaus for the 800 meter run or high jump or shot put, basically, um, in the last few decades, everything is decelerated. Uh, you, you can't really run that much faster, throw that much farther. Uh, I mean, it should be obvious why there are limitations to how far we can throw something or how high we can jump. There are basic limitations that are imposed by the human body, human body design. So speed sca uh, skaters have become faster, but they're, you know, they, ex they, in fact, experience the deceleration uh, right around uh, a little after 2000. Bottom line is, we've reached peak Olympics. We've pretty much reached peak height. We're not going to grow a whole lot taller than we do uh, today on average. Um, some of my colleagues have suggested, by the way, there's no reason why we can't keep growing taller and taller, and we're going to be well. There actually are some pretty good reasons why we're not going to be continuing to grow uh, taller uh, and taller. And so I'll, I'll stop that there on that particular line of reasoning. I've actually got a great hour-long lecture on peak events, but I'll, I'll stop there. All right, this is a useful one because uh, it's another one that involves data. Uh, this is my area of expertise is demography and the demography of longevity and mortality. So I put this line up here, and, and you know, for those of us that are familiar with longevity and mortality, it's like it's so obvious what I'm showing you here. Uh, and that is the risk of death rises as a function of age. Now, when Benjamin Gompertz, an actuary, discovered this in 1825, we didn't really know up until then, roughly, what the mathematics were. What was the relationship between chronological age and the risk of death? Gompertz specified this in 1825. Just so you know, this is a semi-log scale. So a straight line means an exponential increase in the risk uh, of death as a function of age. That line, for the most part, has never changed in history. You've seen reductions in the risk of death uh, across the age structure, but the age trajectory of mortality has never changed. There's high early age mortality, declines to its lowest point right around puberty, rises exponentially thereafter. It's a fundamental attribute of the species. In fact, my colleagues and I have published on this, on why it's a fundamental attribute of many other sexually reproducing species, the J-curve, representing human mortality is consistent uh, across species, is consistent within species. It's a biological attribute. Don't expect this to change anytime soon. Now, having said that, um, it doesn't mean that the wor work in aging biology doesn't have the potential to influence it. And when it does, I would argue you're not going to see a decline in that line. You're going to see a shift to the right and a change in the slope. Mm -hmm. And when we start seeing a change in the slope, of the mortality curve. That's a signal, I would argue, that you're modulating the biological mm -hmm. process of aging, not necessarily a reduction in the age-specific risk of death. Here's an example of, um, of extrapolation that, that uh, I've seen used. This is uh, a decline in the risk of death from cardiovascular disease um, since 1950. It's not like we don't know what's been causing it. The problem is, is that when forecasters estimate where this is all going in the future, they pull out a ruler, and they extend this out into the future, coming to the conclusion that cardiovascular diseases will disappear within the next few years. Now, if you really believe that cardiovascular disease is going to disappear within, within the next few years, this makes sense. There's very few people that I know that actually believe that this is going to happen, which means it has to level off. 
Now keep in mind, death is a zero-sum game. So when death, death rates from one thing goes down, one cause of death goes down, in the end, something else must go up. Those individuals must eventually die from something else. The question is, what is that something else? And that's what I'm going to focus on um, in a moment. All right, so this is an article that, based on an article that my colleagues and I published almost 30 years ago. And I've been questioned about this multiple times since then. This is really incredibly simple. Uh, all we did here was we illustrated how much death rates would have to decline in all ages to increase life expectancy to higher levels. Nothing's changed, by the way, since we published this in Science in, in 1990. In order to get life expectancy at birth up to 100, death rates would have to decline by about 85% at all ages. 85% from total mortality. Uh, you'd have to take 15% of the current schedule of death rates. That's what would be required to get a life expectancy of 100. Don't expect 100 anytime soon uh, for a population. It requires the elimination of almost all major causes of death that exist today. Uh, about a decade later, we published this, also in science, pretty simple. Uh, it shows the relationship between the rise in life expectancy and, uh, and how high life expectancy is. So once life expect when life expectancy at birth is 50, death rates have to decline by about 4.5% to get life expectancy up to 51. A one-year increase requires a 4.5% reduction in death rates at all ages. To go from 80 to 81, the same one-year increase, uh, requires in a population with a life expectancy of 80 about a 9.5% reduction in death rates at all ages. In other words, the higher life expectancy goes, the more difficult it becomes to raise it further. Nothing's changed. We said this 30 years ago. It's exactly the same today. It's precisely the reason why we projected a deceleration in the rate of increase in life expectancy. It's why we predicted this 30 years ago. And indeed, this is exactly what has happened. Life expectancy should be thought of on the Richter scale. The higher it goes, the more difficult it, it becomes to raise it further. In long-lived populations like Israel and elsewhere, we've reached the point of diminishing returns. So don't expect any sort of radical increase in life expectancy. It doesn't mean death rates can't go down. They can. It doesn't mean we can't modify aging. We can. Just don't expect any sort of radical change in the metric of life expectancy itself. The metric is an in insensitive one. And often I'll see these uh, exaggerated numbers of 100, 120, 150, often created by people who probably never actually calculated a life expectancy in their life. Uh, and they don't realize that the metric itself is not a sensitive one and should not be used. All right, how much time do I have? I have 10 minutes left? All right, um, so I'm going to move through this fairly quickly, only because it's... Um, it's, it's a fairly straightforward message. It's the third part of this message of why there's a limitation. And it has to do with basic body design. So years ago, my colleagues and I published an article on, on human body design and, and why it is that there are limitations that are imposed on human longevity. So we asked the question, if we could design the body better, what would it look like in order to, to last longer? So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, this is what we... We're looking at in terms of the kinds of things that go wrong with human bodies, loss of muscle mass, bone density, so forth, um, loss of uh, hearing, vision, sensory impairments. These are all easy to fix on paper, by the way. You can do anything on paper, including, by the way, drawing linear extrapolation lines. Um, so these were easy to fix. We just simply uh, raised the trachea to in, uh, eliminate the problem with, with choking. We increased the size of the outer ear. That's a Spock ear, in case it isn't obvious to those Star Trek fans um, in the audience. Uh, this was a this was a uh, this was a disaster. This particular organ really was not designed for long-term use. Um, you don't run a tube carrying a liquid through an organ that encloses with the passage of time. Um, and by the way, uh, a couple of years ago, I had a kidney stone. Uh, and if I had known at the time just how painful a kidney stone was, I would have fixed that upper tube in the right-hand corner so that there were no nerve endings or the tube was wider, bigger than it is now. Um, where that was not something that I would ever want to go through again. Um, that was an easy fix. Oh, there's my father, by the way, who was a plumber. 
Um, <laughs> and, you know, he would say, this is a plumbing problem. You know, you're moving a liquid through a tube. I mean, that's exactly what, what he would talk about. Um, he was 95 when that picture was, was taken. Abraham. Um, he didn't make it to 170, but 95 was pretty darn good. Uh, lived healthy up until eight days before he died. Um, so, there's the revised version of uh, what the human body might look like if it was designed better. Um, the bottom line is, there's the male version, the bottom line is not that we actually can, can design any better than anyone else or anything else, but that the, we have to live with the body design that we have. Uh, and that was the primary uh, message that we were, we were trying to get across. It doesn't mean we can't modulate aging biology. We can. That's exactly what we should be, be trying to do. All right. So let me, let me convey the message that I think you're going to hear for the next two days. And I will argue it is an absolutely critical message for us to hear. And it's why this is such an exciting field to be in today. Now I'm going to use the analogy of Faust. I assume you, many of you are familiar with the, the story of Faust, Goethe's Faust from a couple of centuries ago. It's a story about uh, uh, an individual who grows disillusioned with life uh, and is about to commit suicide and uh, Mephistopheles, the devil, approaches uh, uh, Faust and says, I I've got a deal for you. I will you know, grant you much longer life and, and health in exchange for your soul when you die. Faust signed the contract, thought it was a really good deal, and, um, you know, it seemed like, like, a, like a, a pretty good idea. Of course, the Faustian bargain is always one where you get something you didn't expect um, in the end. The Faustian bargain is really a perfect analogy for what we've done to ourselves during uh, the course of the, the 20th century and even the 21st century. So let's imagine ourselves in 1850. Uh, and here we are with a life expectancy of around 45 to 50 uh, across most parts of the globe. Uh, Mephistopheles comes to us and says, I've got a deal for you. Uh, the deal is, I'm, I'm going to take away this high infant, child, and maternal mortality. I'm going to grant you 30 years of life. I'm going to give you a wonderful gift of 30 years of life. I'm going to save your children. Uh, and, uh, you know, are you interested in signing that contract? Now, if you were in 1850 and, you know, one quarter to one third of the children were dying before reaching their first birthday, and a lot of people were dying before the age of 50, you would sign that contract, I would sign that contract, that was a good deal. Uh, the problem was, was that we probably didn't know at the time we signed that contract that in exchange, we were going to get to live a whole lot longer into our 70s, 80s, and 90s routinely. Uh, but we were going to get heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, all the things that are associated with aging bodies. I still signed the contract. Even back in 1850, seems like, like a pretty good deal. Almost everybody gets to experience old age. So we got all of that. We got heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's. We also got this insatiable thirst for more longevity. Now, I'm going to remind you of that because that insatiable thirst that Mephistopheles gave us in 1850 is what's driving us in part today. And it's precisely why it is that I think we should not be biting on this next bargain. So what's the next bargain? What's the offer that Mephistopheles is giving us now? Imagine Mephistopheles is in front of us offering us another option. I am going to reduce your risk of heart disease, cancer, and stroke. These are the things that I gave you before. I'm now going to reduce the risk of all of these major diseases that I gave you in exchange for those 30 years of life. I'll reduce heart disease, cancer, stroke. You'll get smaller and smaller gains in life expectancy. Um, you'll get a decelerating increase in life expectancy. Does sound familiar, by the way? Um, you'll get additional survival into extreme old age, certainly past 65, 75, uh, and 85. But the, but the price that you're going to have to pay is the rise of something that you are not going to like. And that is Alzheimer's disease and other neurological conditions that are expressed from our Achilles heel uh, and aging bodies. And I would argue that this contract 
that is before us today, which is to do nothing more but attack heart disease, cancer, stroke, as if they're all somehow independent of each other without some common risk factor, is a mistake. This is a bargain that we should, this is a contract that we should not be signing. Uh, and the contract that we should be signing instead is exactly the contract that you are going to hear about for the next two days. That instead of going after one disease at a time, we need to go after the fundamental biological process of aging itself. Because that is the way in which we attack the things that go wrong with human bodies as we grow older. Now, this is a, an article from an article that I published in JAMA last October, and I know near and and others public, we all published, we were all invited by the editors of, of JAMA to try to convey these messages to other physicians and the general public. This is actually an image that I've been presenting for more than about 15 years. Uh, this is nothing more than, um, for the, anyone who's familiar with uh, the actuarial sciences, this is the distribution of death or the DX column of the life table. If you're not familiar with these sciences, imagine 100,000 babies born in a given year let's say 1900, this would be females, babies born in 1900, and 2016, and this is the ages at which those babies would die based on the observed death rates uh, at all ages in the population today. The black line represents the distribution of death from 1900. You can see maternal mortality right around the age of, of 20. What did we do during the course of the 20th century? We dramatically reduced early age mortality, we redistributed death from the young to the old. We built this mountain of mortality, which is what led to our 30-year increase in life expectancy at birth. And now we have, now we're left with that blue line. And you see this blue line everywhere. You see this exact, it'll look exactly the same in Israel, in Sweden, in Switzerland, in Japan. There'll be sh slight shifts to the right or to the left, depending on what country you're in, but it will all look exactly the same. The problem is, is that we've shifted out this distribution of death into a region of the lifespan where frailty and disability rises exponentially. I call this the red zone. There's a long ex football explanation for why I, I use this red zone. I'm not going to go into detail except to say that this red zone is designed to convey a time period when it's extremely difficult to modulate what goes wrong with us. Uh, and the deeper we go into the red zone, the more frailty and disability we see. So if we continue to, to succeed against heart disease, cancer, and stroke, and I anticipate we will, we will push that distribution of death deeper and deeper into the red zone. But unless we alter the red zone itself, I would argue we will see increases in frailty and disability among future cohorts of older people. The solution is straightforward. Don't try to move the blue line. The focus should be on altering the red zone itself. The time period during which frailty and disability is expressed at later ages. If you push out the red zone, you compress that red zone, you dramatically increase, uh, you dramatically increase healthy uh, lives among future cohorts of older persons. And that's really what aging science and aging biology is all about. I will suggest that uh, there has been considerable movement uh, along this line of reasoning in the last uh, couple of years in particular. This is a paper where we, we coined the term the longevity dividend, but a large number of organizations have come together to support this line of reasoning. I'm actually going to pass by all of this because I'm almost, I want to get to the end here. I do want to emphasize uh, some books that have been written, including one by Ron uh, and Felipe on advances in geroscience. This is a book that we, these are both published right around the same time. Ours is Aging the Longevity Dividend, where the logic and the rationale behind all of this has been set forth in straightforward and clear language. And if you want to see more about uh, some of the science that's going on, uh, I would watch the National Geographic special uh, breakthrough. Uh, that provides some really good information on that, on that history. And I'm going to end with this image. If you can't see it, it says, remember the 20 extra years you added to clean, healthy living? Well, these are that. This is what we want to avoid, is uh, an extended period of frailty and disability at later ages. We want an extended period of youthful vigor. We want to live healthier. 
longer than I think somebody in this room in the next two days is going to be that someone who develops the breakthrough that allows us to alter the red zone rather than just pushing out the blue line. Thank you for your attention. Are there questions? <coughs> What is the question is, what is the prediction for healthy lifespan? So um, there's two ways in which you can generate a prediction of healthy lifespan. One is under the assumption that we do not influence aging biology. And the second one would be, what if we do influence aging biology? So I'm going to answer the second one first, because we've actually published on this. And I, while I can't actually give you a number of how many more healthy years of life we can create, but I can point you to is a manuscript, there was a white paper that we published under uh, funding from the American Federation for Aging Research and elsewhere, suggesting that the number of extremely healthy older individuals will rise dramatically uh, just in the next two decades if we find a way to slow the biological process of aging. The number of more frail elderly individuals will decline rapidly. How much it will influence the metric of, of health expectancy, I don't know. I don't think anyone can actually know that. On the flip side, if we don't find a way to modulate aging in some way, I would argue that we will see some pretty rapid, dramatic increases in the onset and severity and prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and other neurological conditions among cohorts <coughs> that make it old, to older ages in the future. The timing of this is critical, you realize. Because of the aging of the baby boom generation, and how we're moving through the age structure, we have got to act as quickly as possible. I mean, that's why those of us that have written books on this topic have said we need to move as swiftly as possible uh, to influence uh, the aging process in order to have this impact on, on health span. It's a good question. Two more questions. I thought there was one up here, but here, and then please. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, the, thank you for your talk. I want to ask you if you've done any economic study of the burden of that period on the economy. Uh, yes. Uh, so we, we published this a couple of years ago as well. I'd be happy to point you in the direction of the, okay. uh, the manuscript. I, I can't remember where, where we published this. Health, it might have been health affairs. or um, But the amount of money saved by just a minor deceleration in the rate of, of biological aging uh, is huge. Keep in mind that, uh, and, and we've had this, this discussion with multiple uh, uh, physician groups, quite frankly, who don't always think along the lines that we're talking about. I mean, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, treating their patients, extending life, saving them <coughs> from dying. But when we look at things from the population level, we see something uh, totally different. So a minor slowdown in the rate of aging, even by just a year or two. And what does that mean, by the way? Let's just, let me explain what that means. A slowdown in the rate of aging of three years would imply whatever it is that happens at, 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 at 67 would happen at 70, right? So you, you're essentially <laughs> delaying everything. And since, since the risk of all of these events uh, doubles about every seven to eight years, a minor deceleration in the rate of aging has a cascading effect on all fatal and disabling diseases simultaneously. So the health impact the economic impact of compressing that red zone is huge. It's in the trillions of dollars for each country. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite large. Last question. Okay. Uh, you talk about shifting the whole paradigm of the medicine. Now the medicine is symptom-based, and you made about ca casualty-based the medicine. Medicine is symptom based. Symptom. Symptom based. Yes. Medicine. And you're suggesting. Are you suggesting actually casualty based medicine because you talk about aging is the cause of the symptom that now. Uh... Yes. I mean, I think I think that's the that's that's the message. The message is is that instead of going after the diseases and and disorders that are associated with growing older go after the underlying bi biological process itself, which is the underlying risk factor for almost everything that goes wrong with aging bodies. So instead of treating the consequences, you treat the 
cost. And it just makes much more sense. Now, again, I'm not suggesting that we're going to achieve any sort of radical life extension as a result. That's not the goal. I do believe we will live longer when we succeed in slowing the biological process of aging. But the, but the goal isn't to make us live longer. The goal is to make us live healthier longer, compress that, that red zone into, into a much shorter duration of time near the end, end of life. The impact, I think, will be enormous. Well, Thank you. Me. Basically, the goal is to die healthy. Sorry, say again? The goal is to die healthy. The goal is to die healthy. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I showed you a picture of my father, right? He, he, was, he was healthy right up until eight days before he died. Things went down very, very quickly. If you could choose a way to go, that, that would be it. To, to compress that red zone, to, for, for when bad things happen, to happen over a very short time period. The cost savings, as you might imagine, since the vast majority of the, of the money spent on health care is, is in that last year of life, this can have a pretty dramatic positive impact on uh, health economies across the globe. So. Hopefully it's, hopefully it's an obvious argument that's being made here. It's not always well understood by everyone. Um, and, and many of the researchers that are going to develop the breakthrough, it's, it's easier for me to say because I'm not the one, one that's going to develop the breakthrough. It's going to be one of them. Um, so I'm sort of on the outside uh, looking in. I can, I can make that argument and, and line of reasoning sometimes uh, in some ways more efficiently uh, uh, than them but they're the ones that are going to make the breakthrough. Thank you. So uh, I'm the next speaker, and I'll take the liberty in the interest of time of introducing myself. Uh, topic I'm sort of familiar with. I also have a PhD from the University of Chicago, two uh, after J, but in biochemistry. Um, I was on the faculty at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, and then at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore. I joined the NIH in 2005, and with Felipe Sierra, uh, I co-founded the Geoscience Interest Group at the NIH. Okay. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of some concepts and perspectives in general science. <coughs> so, um, there, general science has been described by uh, us and others uh, as hallmarks of aging that can be uh, understood as uh, biomarkers that have specific contexts and in the interests of advancing anti-aging uh, medicines and pharmaceuticals uh, they're useful in the design, performance, and analysis of clinical trials and uh, studies, so both in the clinic and in the um, basic research. Biomarker is important, but what is a biomarker? So if I get into a biomarker, there's different ways of looking at aging. Uh, as Jay has basically explained, you have life, which is going through the day, and aging is when you find it's more difficult to go through the day. Uh, but those difficulties can be understood at uh, multiple levels. There are functional hallmarks of aging. So um, you can look at them uh, at, at uh, a, a broad level in terms of, of what you do, right? You spend some time sleeping, uh, and that changes as you get older. Your immunity declines, your cognitive function often, but not always declines somewhat. Mobility, which is of course linked to strength, uh, those decline. Uh, your weight can uh, change in ways that are either up or down, depending on uh, where you are in the life trajectory. Your balance isn't so great. You tend to feel colder. There's that famous picture of Madame Clément at 127, wrapped up in a shawl. Um, she was feeling pretty cold. Skin changes. Uh, your circulation declines. There are a lot of, of general things that affect you uh, in what you do. But they're also what could be called clinical hallmarks of aging, and there will be some overlap as I go through the different kinds of hallmarks of aging. Um, so uh, there are things that kill you: cancers, heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, these all these will all put you in the ambulance. These things can 
if you're in front of a bus and you're dealing with some of these issues, they will put you in the ambulance, but they won't kill you directly. Um, so frailty, as understood by uh, Linda Free and others, is an indication of how well you're going to do if you go through surgery, uh, your likelihood of survival. All of these things decrease. The um, arthritis and sarcopenia might make it harder for you to get out of the way of the bus. You might not have heard the bus coming. You might have missed seeing. On the other hand, there are uh, other things which don't really fall into the category, uh, which also can increase with age, such as immunity, but those lead you to be more susceptible to infections. Then uh, you could look at the organ level for aging. And uh, these organs can be understood individually. They can also be understood as interactive. And that's what the, uh, ultimately the purpose of all of these intersecting lines is, that you can link uh, two organs to each other in terms of their function. But it's also important to think of these in terms of different evolutionary pressures uh, that came into play in these uh, tissues and systems. For example, um, you might suspect, I don't know, but you might suspect that uh, muscle or bone uh, evolutionary pressures on the evolution on uh, the development of the body plan that is supportive of the uh, rest of the organ systems would be under somewhat different constraints than, let's say, the liver. So you would, might think that the bone uh, is based on you know, evolution is based on pressures for locomotion, um, as well as uh, postural effects, uh, relative stress, when muscles are interacting with the bone in ways that uh, make mobility under various conditions um, uh, workable for that particular uh, player species. And the liver, on the other hand, is uh, under pressure to be uh, adaptable and to be diverse in its responses. So um, the, the liver is a detoxification organ, and uh, the co life course, a person or other, any animal, would be exposed to a lot of different um, toxicants. And uh, you might think that livers that have a broader range of responsiveness to a broader range of toxicants might confer an evolutionary advantage, and so on. So there are, moving down uh, from, uh, to, from organs to cells, uh, there are cellular hallmarks of aging, uh, many of which have not quite made uh, or captured the attention of people who research in biology of aging. But uh, there are stress responses at the cellular level, which are critical um, and can be understood at molecular levels as well as the cellular level. But cells do things, including die. A cell that dies is not simply dead, but it releases signals about its death that are informative to other cells around it. Cells make, under, very, under the regulation of other molecule, or molecules and interactions with other cells, make cell fate decisions. Those are understood very well in the uh, developmental processes. They're understood somewhat less well in the aging process. But our cells, even as we are older, still have cell fate decisions that have to be determined. And that links to progenitor cells, which are uh, the inheritors of uh, stem cells in their function. But there's also senescence at various levels. Immune senescence is a particular category because of the complexity of the adaptive immune system, certainly, but senescence being broad property of uh, cells uh, as they age. We don't know, we know cells senesce, we know there's an increased burden with age in mammals, uh, we don't quite yet know where the threshold is between uh, senescence, some of which is good for you, some of which is bad for you. Uh, we don't know how much senescence uh, in terms of cell numbers is bad or densities, but part of that suggests that there's a, a failure of integration of cells in tissues that uh, may contribute to aging. Then there are some autonomous hallmarks of aging. Again, we have regulated cell death, as I mentioned. There's a uh, death-associated molecular uh, pattern that is released upon various kinds of cell death. But I don't know, 18 kinds of cell death the last I looked, but then I looked again, and there were 25 kinds of cell death. It's hard to keep up with them. Then uh, there's the senescence, the senescence associated secretory phenotype that uh, Judy Kinkies and others are defining. You also have the clear cells, which is a problem. They're extracellular vesicles. <coughs> cells put on all sorts of stuff that contains information. Uh, there are pleuronic factors, which are factors that can, uh, are responsible for rejuvenation 
or accelerated aging of a very restricted experimental paradigm where blood is exchanged between an old and a young animal, and vice versa. These are the factors that convey accelerated aging or um, rejuvenation. Of course, um, endocrine and neuroendocrine factors are clearly important. Then there are the molecular hallmarks of aging, uh, which has actually probably received the most attention. There are changes in the genome, changes in the epigenomics, to that is a major proponent of how to use the epigenomic changes to understand uh, the biology of aging. Uh, he has created and moved that field substantially, I think I could say. He's had his program officer from time to time. <coughs> um, there are things that are uh, involved in proteostasis, the ability to maintain a proteome uh, that is functional. It points to an interesting fact of biology that things are not one or zero. They're not computers. We make analogies to them, but they're highly inaccurate. Things are more or less in biology. Things are faster or slower. Um, in cases where things are all or none, it's a, it's a bit unusual. Uh, of course, metabolism is a major feature in, in changes in metabolism provide major features in the biology of aging. But the viewpoint that we are trying to take and where we support a lot of research is in how do these interact? How does, for example, shortening of the telomere interact with uh, mitochondria uh, and which may be influenced downstream, let's say, uh, diametric pair in, in the genome. So there are lots of interactions. The epigenome obviously is involved in all of these uh, because it's sort of part of the regulation of what's expressed, but also in the uh, genome, there's the nuclear structure and the interactions with the nuclear envelope. Everything interacts with everything. In short, you have systems level analysis of the molecular hallmarks of aging. But you can do the analysis on a different level. You can ask, um, how is it that these cellular, cell non-autonomous and molecular features affect the organs, the various uh, functions, and clinical presentations that we observe in the aging body? And, as if that wasn't a difficult enough problem, we also take medications, uh, more medications as we get older. Probably pharmacy is a significant area of studying uh, research on aging. There are issues with diet. Uh, there are more diets than you can shake a stick at any given day, any time of the month. There are diets that are specific for these amino acids or those carbohydrates or no carbohydrates at all. Some lipids, some fats, some ketone bodies. You can eat now, you can eat later, you can stop eating. I don't recommend that for long periods of time. Um, but uh, it can either be healthy or lead you to have mystical um, revelations. Um, and then, of course, the environment affects us. Uh, pollutants in the environment, exposures to radiations, changes in the environment, all these things are uh, big deals, behaviors, um, good and bad. And I don't know why it is that the bad behaviors are more fun, but they also <laughs> affect you with aging. Uh, so the biology of aging is complex. 30 years ago, the Division of Aging Biology at the National Institute on Aging started a program under uh, the guidance of Anna McCormick, no longer at the NIA. Um, and uh, the program that she instigated was to look at changes in lifespan uh, as a function of uh, genetic composition of a laboratory organism, uh, noting that uh, some work in Cialidus elegans had been done searching for genes that affected age, and Thusel genes found a lot of interesting things were found, so let's do this a little bit more systematically and ask for longevity assurance genes. Genes that would take the normal population and increase its lifespan. Of course, as you're screening for genes that increase lifespan, you're going to find some whose ablation decreases lifespan. This wasn't a search for allelic variants. This was knock out the gene and see what happens. So um, interestingly enough, it worked quite well. Um, and we now have about 430 genes that affect lifespan. How they are integrated is, of course, an interesting question. But as Jay pointed out, lifespan isn't what we're concerned with so much anymore. We're also concerned with health span. So lifespan put biology of aging on the map to a large extent, and it was a surrogate for aging. Age, this measures age at death, but what we're interested in is what happens, what's the process that goes on before we die? 
And it's also the case, interestingly, but not surprisingly, that anything that you do that affects lifespan doesn't affect every organism, every single animal in the study. What you get out of it is a distribution, you get a range. If you took um, a little bit of these curves, you'd end up with, um, with the way they're drawn, you'd anyway, end up with kind of Gaussian curve. So, Go, trying to put these two things together, the hallmarks of aging are integrated as a biological network, which can be understood from systems level analysis. Systems levels are not bioinformatics. They don't just give you lists of things that go up and down with age. They tell you how things interact with each other so that um, it is now generally understood that you can have a whole cluster of genes that will make small contributions to an out, a biological outcome. And how they interact with each other is the network. So you can uncover networks of all kinds of biological processes, and we think that you can also uncover networks of aging. That is, it's not networks of disease, it's networks of these things that change that make it ultimately harder for us and our lab animals to get through the day. Um, so what you have is from all of this, at any level you wish to choose, or any combination of levels, you can have a composite metric for hallmarks of this biological process that is aging. And on that, you'll find that some, there's an average, just uh, from the composite, and some are younger and some are older. And if you look at the work of Dan Belsky, now at Columbia University, he's done with this, this with the Dunedin study, giving people at the age of 38, they fall from birth, and you find some of them look like they're in their 20s, and some look like they're in their 50s. So there are composite metrics for processes that occur over time, biological processes. I guess that's redundant. All processes occur. So you have fetal development, which has a balance score. You can look at the uh, fetus, and you can make various measurements of various organ distributions. You can tell what stage of development that fetus is, whether it's Drosophila melanogaster, Mus musculus, or Homo sapiens. There are scores that will tell you where it is in development, and you can also look in more detail to see if development is well coordinated. There's at birth, there's a score from Virginia Apgar, um, one of the first female uh, professors at Columbia University, College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, this tells you the relative health of the baby. It's your first exam. If you'd like to pass it. There's maturation, which is uh, transition from uh, uh, early preteen years to uh, reproductive maturity or capability. And there's a Tanner scale. You can measure all sorts of things in males and in females, primary characteristics, secondary characteristics. At the outer level, they tell you what's happening at the inner level, which is for moment. Um, so you have a back and forth between the molecular and the physiological. So for aging, there should be something out there. And there are things out there. There are frailty indices. There are resilience indices. Uh, but you can also make up any range of things that you want to do that cover everything from the molecular to the activities that they were living. And you can put these metrics together in some fashion that you can then use to test interventions that might affect aging. So uh, Jay alluded to this, and I have a little bit more uh, of an imaginative detail on this. But it's a little bit weird to walk through it. So you start out with a population that has some hallmarks or signatures of aging. And you have a starting population. And you're going to spend some time giving them an intervention and then wait some other period of time to see the outcome. So the question is, if this is a human population and you intervene at 30, do you have to wait 40 years to see if the intervention works? It's a very difficult question. But you try to model this in laboratory animals. So you start out with, here's your population at age X. And at some time later, Y time, you have a population that has X plus Y. But your reference population, let's say it's people. Okay? So you have a bunch of 50-year-olds, you're going to do an intervention in 2020. And you have a bunch of 80-year-olds in 2020, and you map their distribution here. So if you've intervened in aging in a positive fashion with your 50-year-olds, and you have 30 years of funding to wait, uh, then you'll see that your population has either shifted to younger ages from your 2020 reference population in 2050, or they shifted the other way, or the distribution hasn't changed that much, but you've got uh, a few more at the younger age, uh, with the younger parents and a few less at the older parents. So this is kind of how an intervention against aging might work 
if you're looking at it at the population level. Or you could try to take some intermediate times and expect to predict what's going to happen over the long term. So uh, Vadim Vladeshev uh, has recently developed a set of signatures of aging um, that is described in a paper that I think came out a week or two ago, where you look at a bunch of interventions, you try to find some common signatures of aging, and you see, going back to test, which is yet to do, really, uh, he's, he, he got this, pulled the signatures out of interventions that affect lifespan in laboratory mice of various kinds and various conditions. Uh, and then he's, he's trying to use that as a screen for compounds. So he's asking, at least in the laboratory mouse, can you take a shorter period of time and make a prediction about what would happen in a longer period of time? That sets up a paradigm for how you use a signature <coughs> agent taken from the laboratory animal and attempt to apply it to a human population. And I hope it works. So, what do you need if you're going to do interventions against aging and you're going to look at a human population? So, NIA has had some interactions with the Food and Drug Administration on this. I can report that the Food and Drug Administration thinks that their guidance on the development of pharmaceuticals and drugs is sufficient for any group that wants to work on biology of aging. There may be disagreement as to whether or not it's sufficient. But people at the FDA recognize that at this point, there are no interventions against aging. But if there were such an intervention, that would change the whole game. And they might have to add some guidance specifically about compounds against the biology of aging. This may also be the case in other regulatory agencies in other countries. So what you need are biomarkers, which were mentioned earlier, whatever they are, at any level of those seven levels of hallmarks of aging. You need to be able to select a, a population that, uh, to use in a clinical study. And then you need markers for the conditions that are going to be affected. What are those conditions of aging has proven to be somewhat difficult, but you need them for primary and secondary endpoints. You need biomarkers for target efficiency, according to the current guidelines of the FDA, of the US Food and Drug Administration. And then, ultimately, you need a clear-cut way of labeling the pharmaceutical for the various conditions of use. We already know that not every pharmaceutical is suitable for every person, and it's not suitable for everybody of ethnic, of any ethnic background, nor are they suitable for necessarily both genders. So to conclude, basically, we have geroscience, which goes from the lab to your home. And in geroscience, with the laboratory organisms, I should include yeast, which are fungi, not animals, that biomarkers can be developed in the laboratory because you can take the animal apart. You can't do that to a person. Not ethically. You can take a mouse apart, blood, well, its liver. The liver is a good uh, one to look at because it has all that adaptation that's required. So the loss of that adaptation and loss of heterogeneity, actually, could be a hallmark of aging in the liver. It also undergoes fibrosis, which is a major problem physiologically with aging. So you can develop biomarkers in the laboratory and ask, do they apply to the human population? Conversely, you can start with the human population where we have much more information um, <coughs> from the point of view of uh, demography and epidemiology. We know about activities of daily living in human beings. They're readily quantified, they're readily interrogated. Uh, reliably interrogated, I don't know, but at least they're readily accessible. Frailty, we have various indices for, and also we have indices for resilience. Just a short comment on resilience. It's can you push back against the challenge? Can you restore your steady state after being pushed off the pedestal as it were? Can you climb back up? How hard is it to climb back up? How long does it take you to climb back up? How far back up the pedestal do you get? These are all features that fall, figure into resilience which again is more readily measured, I think, in human beings than in the laboratory animal. But under Felipe's guidance, there is a program developed under development uh, now where the people, the investigators are trying to develop metrics of resilience in the laboratory animals, specifically laboratory mice, I believe, uh, that may recapitulate the resilience that's seen in human beings and with vastly different species. I think Rafa may or may not talk about comparisons between mice and humans this time around, but if not, you can read all about it in his uh, publications. So, geroscience, the geroscience hypothesis 
um, which to my recollection was coined by Steve Austad, uh, or formulated by Steve Austad and Jim Kirkland, who was a co-author with Jay on the book on longevity of dividend. Um, you, if you delay, if you slow the rate of aging, as Jay said, you delay the onset of multiple chronic diseases, you also reduce the severity of multiple chronic diseases. Ultimately, neuroscience could help you get through that. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If not now, later. Excellent. Okay. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Ostad. I have to say a few words. Um, Steve got his PhD from Purdue, Purdue University in Indiana. Among his many activities in the service of geroscience, he's the scientific director of the American Federation of Aging Research. Not a dusty job, by any means. Uh, his research covers aging in animals as diverse as lambs and bats. And as I just mentioned, he is one of the people who has articulated the uh, geroscience hypothesis. In addition to which, he is the 2011 recipient of the Irving S. Wright Award Distinction in Biology. If I had just walked into this room, uh, I would probably be pretty glum right now. I, I, I found out that our biology is limiting our link with health. Geroscience is a wonderfully interesting field, but so complex that we're not likely to ever be able to make much headway against slowing human aging. And so what I like to do with the rest of this is, is to use that framework to, uh, for some good news. Or sometimes complexity uh, collapses into greater simplicity, and sometimes uh, what looks uh, very difficult to do turns out not to be so difficult. So let me start off. Uh, I don't have any disclosures, and I always say, uh, alas, when I say that, but uh, I, I, I'm always in the market for disclosures. <laughs> I'm going to try to do three things today, because I, I think in this short talk, I, I should be able to highlight something. First of all, I'd like to describe some real successes uh, in employing geroscience discoveries to extend health and resist diseases in animal models. And by animal models, I mean mice. And I'm not going to talk about anything else by, uh, except mice today, a little bit about humans, and I think that's bad. I think the fact that all of our uh, mammalian aging research has basically collapsed out into a single species is very bad. I think we need to do something about that. But that's another talk. The second thing I'd like to talk about is to describe some sex difference in laboratory animals, again, by which I mean mice, to ex uh, in their response to experimental treatments which really do target aging. And the last thing uh, I would like to do is to talk about how those sex differences may influence the way we think about human medicine. So let me just jump right in to that and say, when I started in aging research uh, back in the Pleistocene, we wanted to get away from diseases. We wanted to not talk about diseases. We wanted to talk about aging independent of diseases. And aging is independent diseases. And you can see this very simply if you look at this graph here, which is the foot speed of the world record holder at various distances as a function of age. Now these are world record holders. So the hardest training, they're the healthiest people of their age, but yet there is this inexorable decline in the rate at which they run. And I bet anybody in this room, if you ask them, and I said, can you run as fast at the age of 50 as you could uh, run at the age of 20? Nobody could say that, at least, at least for a spring. So there is an aging process independent of diseases, but that aging process clearly interacts with diseases 
And that's what geroscience is all about. Geroscience is about understanding that interaction. And the interaction is very simple in any of dozens of curves that you can see like that, where the, fr fr uh, the fraction of people dying of specific diseases increases massively over the decades. For most the diseases here, you can see that at the ages of 30s and 40s, you can't hardly distinguish them from the axis, they're so low. But over the next two or three or four decades, they increase by hundreds to thousands of fold. And that's geroscience in its essence. But, the, but what that means is the aging process itself kills and debilitates far more people than any other single cause, more than heart disease, more than cancer, more than Alzheimer's disease. <coughs> And that's because it's an underlying risk for all of those diseases. And if we can do something, if we can treat aging as a process, then we ought to be able to do something about all those diseases as a group. And that's the geroscience hypothesis. Now I'm going to focus in narrowly on just a few studies here, because I think the studies have sort of come and gone without people particularly realizing the incredible implications of these studies. And the, the first series of studies I'm going to look at uh, is something that the NIA funded almost, I guess about 15 years ago, the Interventions Testing Program, which was really seeking to implement geroscience. And all that program did is it, it funded three laboratories <coughs> to independently study whether drugs that would be given in food and water could extend mouse lifespan. And there's, there's some real key features of this. First of all, it's done three places. So uh, if you get a hit, then it's a hit that sort of has automatic duplication or replication, meaning that we, have a lot, we should have a lot more confidence in it. Because I have to tell you, because aging studies, even in mice, are so expensive and take so long, we have very little replication of studies outside of, of a single lab. And that, again, is a problem. Now, for the first few years, uh, the, an intervention uh, testing program tested some drugs and they published the results. And this is one of the things that they said they would do is we're going to publish the results, whether they're positive or negative. And they got a couple of promising looking hits, but they were minor hits. That is, they had small but statistically a, a, a significant effects on, on mouth lifespan. But then came uh, 2009, 2009, uh, exactly 10 years ago. Uh, when suddenly they hit it very, very, very big. And they hit it very, very big because they finally found the first drug to extend life, at that point we didn't know anything at all about health, but to extend life uh, in both sexes of a mammal, and it was mice. And that drug was rapamycin. And you've probably all heard of rapamycin now, and rapamycin had its day in the sun, and, and, and that day in the sun is kind of faded, and I'm not exactly sure why, because I'm going to present some evidence today that makes me think that this is something that, that, that the investigations into need to double and redouble and redouble again. Here's what the first study looked like. Um, uh, rapamycin was uh, started to be administered in food at 600 days of age, and that was an accident. It was an accident because they had trouble getting the rapamycin to be stable in the food, but when they did that, they got a lengthening of life from the time that they started giving the drug of 38% in females and 28% in males. They may have heard a much lower percent than that, but that's because of the bizarre way that they analyzed the data. They analyzed the data. This is how much it increased life, life expectancy from birth. But if you don't start giving a drug until 20 months of age, why you would consider life expectancy from birth to be the appropriate analysis, uh, I've never understood. Now beyond that, there's three reasons that this, that this study was really important. One is that the drug was begun relatively late. Like I said, that was an accident. But up to then, the prevailing wisdom in the field is that you have to start, to, if you're going to have an effect on health and longevity in later life, you need to start something early. And this disproved that. At least for this drug, this show you didn't have to start it early. So that was an important lesson, and that's not only turned out to be true with rapamycin, but for a number of things. And again, I think that's an incredibly important lesson, because when people are 30, 
They think they're never going to get old. They never, they're never going to need any drug like this. But by the time they're 50 or 60, they know better. The second thing is that the study used genetically heterogeneous mice. They, they used basically a combination of four inbred strains that were bred together uh, multiple times so that each individual mouse in the study uh, was uh, unique. And the third thing is that, and they didn't know this at the time, but we now know, that that drug did many things, many things, besides extending life. And let me go through some of the many things uh, that it did, because I think that's important. First of all, this was the first study. And you, you can immediately see one problem with the male study, which is what had happened is they'd set these animals aside reading through the study, and then when they couldn't get the drug in the food, the animals stayed there, and when they finally did it, they decided to do them. Well, some of them had died already. So you can see the males that started dying, uh, the ones that ultimately got the drug were dying at a lower rate, even before they got the drug. So there was some concern that maybe this was an artifact, but follow-up studies showed that, first of all, the greater the dose, the greater the effect. It worked in both sexes, although it didn't work so uh, uh, well in males as it did in females. Now the reason I say that this is uh, so exciting is it didn't just uh, work in these three labs with this particular genotype of mouse. It turned out that its length of life in multiple labs, in multiple genotypes, here are two male studies on the top, different doses, of rapamycin, uh, different protocols. Both of these started relatively late in life, but both with a substantial effect. The key thing to note here is that even though the earlier studies showed a greater effect in females than in males, there's a big effect in males here. And in fact, in the study on the left, there was really no effect in the females. So one can kind of titrate the relative effect on the two sexes by titrating the dosage. And we don't understand this, and it doesn't have to do with the blood levels of this, with differences in metabolism. It has to do with things we don't know about. So, uh, sexes, it doesn't work equally well in both sexes. Now, here's a geroscience perspective on this. Remember, the geroscience hypothesis is that if you find something that treats the underlying causes of aging, it will prevent or delay vast numbers of diseases at the same time. So there have now been almost 30 studies of longevity as a function of lifespan in mice. Um, there's a few of the citations. The other thing it's been shown to do is prevent entirely or delay several types of cancer. It's also been known in mouse models of atherosclerosis and, and, and just normal late life dysfunction to improve that. It's been shown to rejuvenate hematopoietic stem cells. It's been shown to enhance and broaden the protection from vaccine in older animals. I have an asterisk there because this has also been shown in humans one of the few things that, that you can do in a short term in humans. So the effect that was shown in mice and rapamycin, at least for the vaccine effects, has been replicated in humans. And it delays the progression and slows, uh, it delays the onset, slows the progression in the whole range of Alzheimer's mouse models. Now, Alzheimer's mouse models have not turned out to be that informative therapeutically, so we'll take that for a grain of thought. But yet you look at this list of things that it does, and it looks very, very much like something that really could be said to be a poster child for the geroscience hypothesis. And this is actually just, just, just a, a micrograph of the way it reduces A beta 1 to 142 in the hypothalamus of one of these mouse models. So if it did all that, it would be a wonderful success, but you know what? It also does these things. Protects aging muscle. Preserves ovarian egg reserve. Inhibits senescence, cellular senescence in multiple cell types. 
prevents surgically induced immune dysfunction, has some effects on hearing, protects skin fibroblasts from UV damage. Now, this is starting to look almost like a miracle drug in mouse. If you're a mouse, go on rapamycin today. <laughs> Not delay. Um, protects against uh, damage from early life hemorrhage, all kinds of things. Improves muscle mitochondrial DNA quality. And this is, actually isn't the limit. I just thought I can't take my whole talk enumerating all the things that rapamycin does. But, he, but, but, but nothing is free. <laughs> nothing is free in life. You know, there are some downsides. And, and, and uh, one of the downsides is that it doesn't protect against anything. It's actually, uh, it, it, it reduces glucose tolerance. So it's diabetogenic under many circumstances in both mice and humans. Uh, it can impair T cell function in old mice. It can inhibit muscle hypertrophy from exercise. So if you want to bulk up in the, in the, in the, uh, in the gym, you probably don't want to be on rapamycin because it's uh, inhibition of protein synthesis really doesn't help you build up muscle. Uh, if you're a growth hormone knockout mouse or person, you have Laron syndrome, stay away from rapamycin. And if you have leptin receptor deficiency, stay away from that. Now, all of these things are uh, side effects that one would want to avoid. All of these things are also things that there are other therapeutic approaches to. So I think the key is that just like everything else, just like HIV, just like cancer, ultimately, when it comes to maintaining health, longer and longer, we are going to have a combination therapy. And if we can have a, a drug like metformin that is good against diabetes, protects against glucose intolerance, that might make a nice combination. And I have to say, I'm surprised that rapamycin hasn't taken off in clinical trials more than it has. Now that's the big success of the ITP. And I would say at this point in life, that's the poster child for the success of the geroscience hypothesis. But it's not the only one. You often hear we don't really understand much about aging. I disagree. I think the rest of the talks you hear in this symposium will show you that we actually do know a great deal about aging. And I think this is shown by the fact of the results of the interventions testing program. That column on the left shows all the successes that they've had. All the drugs that at least <coughs> in one sex have, have significantly extended life. The other two columns are the non-successes. And it's roughly one-third to one-fourth of the studies have been successful. Now, the way you get your drug tested, the ITP, is you simply tell them you want to test it, you give them some reason to try it, and they'll do it. And um, I think this is a remarkable success rate, to tell you the truth. I think most pharmaceutical companies would be absolutely delighted with this success rate. The one thing that I want you to notice in that left column is most of those drugs only work in one sec. And even the ones that work in two sexes quite often work in one sex better than the other. And this is the second huge surprise that's come out recently. Surprise number one, that you could start drugs relatively late in life and get a major benefit on health. Two, that there seems to be some sort of sex bias in the effectiveness of certain drugs. And I think that's something that we need to pay attention to. We can't just look at it and say, oh, that's very nice, and, and go on. And so I'd like to move on to a little about the sex differences in aging in humans, because they're remarkable. And it may turn out that there are different therapies, not just for aging, because I think that's starting to look very much like the case, but there are different therapies in many, many realms for men and women. I think this is likely to be where personalized medicine gets its start is in sex-specific medicine. So, just to tell you something about the obvious. This is something that we all know intuitively. So this is life expectancy at, at, age, at birth and age 50 in Iceland over uh, about a century and a half. And because Iceland has, been, has a small homogenous uh, population, 
during various out, uh, epidemic outbreaks, life expectancies dropped as low as 18 years and has gone as high as 80 years over that 150 year period. In each and every one of those years, women have had a higher life expectancy than men. And Iceland is not aberrant like this. Uh, anybody recognize this person here? Probably most people in the audience uh, recognize uh, Jean Calvon, the oldest woman uh, that we know has ever lived. But here's the second oldest woman, Sarah Knauf. These are the oldest 10 people that we ever had. Anybody see anything similar about them? <laughs> right? They're all women. There's some serious biological underlying factors that makes women better survivors than men. And they're better survivors in good time, they're better survivors in bad time, they're better survivors over most of the diseases that we know that kill people. So here are the top 10 diseases uh, in the US, the top 10 causes of death. And you can see stroke, the two sexes die at about the same rate. The only one that women seem to die at a higher rate than men have is Alzheimer's disease. Everything else, men are the weaker vessel. Again, we don't understand that at all, but the implications of this are that women, are that the population, as we get older, gradually becomes more and more female biased. And the other part of this is called the mortality morbidity paradox, which is that even though women live longer, they tend to be in somewhat worse health as they get older. Because the older men, when they get in worse health, they fall over. You know, the women, they just, they just keep going on. But if you, look at what, if you look at nursing homes, you can see that there's a slight increase below in the sex ratio in populations. But if you look at the sex ratio in nursing homes, it really rises very dramatically, which means that this is not a problem that falls on the sexes equally. And there's some fundamental biology that we know now differs between the sexes that we might pay attention to. And I'm just going to give a couple of quick and easy examples. Uh, this actually shows the decrease in different types of muscle fibers as a function of age in men and women. And as you can see in the first slide, which is the slow twitch muscles, there's very little decrease in the number of fibers in women across the age from 20 to 70. And there's actually an increase in males. And if you look at uh, different types of fibers, you can see in, in all of these cases, there's a difference in fiber loss. And these are in people that are non-exercisers, not trained people. Even more spectacular is the difference in pain. Now this is about 60 studies in which people were asked to rate uh, levels of pain. And you can see in virtually every single study, uh, women were subject to more pain. The interesting thing is the therapeutics of pain are very different. The actual mechanisms of pain, of certain types of pain, are different in men and women. So the types of pain that are successfully treated by inhibitors of, of microglial function work very well in male, male mice, they don't work at all in female mice. If you castrate the male, they don't work in them either. If you inject the females with testosterone, then they work in them. So even something as basic as pain relief, there's a substantial sex difference there. As a consequence of all this, a couple of years ago, the NIH says it's no longer good enough to balance the sexes in your human clinical trials. You need to do it in your animal trials as well, and I think this is not a nuisance. It's an opportunity for all of us. Because one day, when we all have these medications that we take to preserve our health, another 10 or 20 years, it may be that the women in the audience are taking different medications than the men in the audience. Thank you. Questions for Steve Austin? Uh, I think the problem with rapamycin in clinical trials is that it has a, a bad reputation among clinicians. So it's currently used in the clinic in at least three contexts. One is in some uh, cancer chemotherapy cocktails. Uh, two is part of an immunosuppressive cocktail for mostly for kidney transplants. And three, it's, uh, it's, it's embedded in most 
coronary artery stents. It has some side effects at the doses that it's used in those contexts, particularly in chemotherapy and in the uh, uh, rejection cocktails. But at lower levels than that, like the lower levels that they were giving people in these vaccine trials, the side effects are really quite minimal. But those aren't the typical uh, doses that are used in the clinic. So I think there's a resistance from clinicians who've seen people with mouth sores with all kinds of problems from this. But they were at doses that may not be the proper therapeutic doses for, for geroscience purposes. Questions? What's your opinion about the intermittent dosing that Alan Green is promoting? By the way, I started to take, first it was very difficult to convince any physician to prescribe rapamycin. They heard about rapamycin, side effect, boom. I, get, I, I managed to get my hands on rapamycin and just started recently to take uh, intermittent low dose rapamycin. But probably you need synergies with other drugs and money that you mentioned uh, is in his last paper is uh, synergizing rapamycin with another drug in development. That raises issues of how to develop drugs, multifactorial drugs, which have synergies but very difficult to develop. And by the way, till clinical trials of our age, or of my age, till, till we see clinical trials will be definitely dead long, long after. Well, I think, I, think, I think Nir may have mentioned something about that in his talk. But let me just talk about the intermittent dosing, because I think that's a very important thing. It may be, there is some evidence that rapamycin or rapalogs, you know, analogs for rapamycin, are effective in intermittent doses, and some of the side effects are lessened. For instance, there's, there's nice studies in mice that shows that this diabetogenic effect goes away fairly quickly. And the other thing about combination drugs, you're right, in the study by Manis, she's got two mTOR inhibitors, but they work slightly differently, and she puts them together. I think we don't know enough about this yet to really come up with, but it strikes me as an incredibly fertile uh, ground for further experiment for looking at dosage, timing, even time of day, I think, could turn out to be important. Last question. question. It seems rapamycin works well, even with side effects. My question personal for you, do you use rapamycin by yourself? Do I use rapamycin? <laughs> I wouldn't touch the stuff. No, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not one of those researchers who sees some mouse study and goes out and starts taking the drugs. I want to see the human trials first. So I exercise, I eat right, I don't take any of the stuff. You'll have to talk to my colleagues uh, who, who believe in their research enough to do that. <laughs> so, um, Could I just say the next speaker is uh, Nir Barzilai. Gabi has already introduced Nir, but I need to add a couple of things. One, he's the 2010 recipient of the Irving S. Ward Award for Distinction in Aging Research. But if you allow me a moment to kid us with my friend, following Steve ta Steve's talk on sex differences, you need to mention that sorrow lived to be 127. Okay, that's one. Two, Abraham didn't stop <laughs> when he was 100. When he was uh, at least 30 years later, probably 40 years later, he had another wife, Katura. That was his third sex partner. Yeah. That was incredible. And he had six boys with this woman. Okay? The other thing is, when you're telling family stories, and everybody's got a family story about caring for an older parent, you need to mention that Yitzchak had all these infirmities of old age that he, were described in some detail. And Yaakov, Jacob, also not only had infirmities, he had a bad attitude. When he was asked his age by Pharaoh, he said, ah, my, I'm more bitter in my life, and it's not even as long as my father's. <laughs> so, you know, get the whole story. <laughs> we're only four minutes in the beginning, okay? <laughs> but, the, but really, there's, there's an obsession in the Bible. For example, Sarah 
it's the whole portion, Parashat Sarah starts with Sarah was 100 years and 20 years and she died and then it moves to somewhere else. But this obsession is really telling us something. Uh, so so let, let me tell you uh, also an Israeli story that it was influenced by, uh, before the Six Days War, I went with my parents to to Hasne Insurance Company. Is Hasne still on? Is this still on? Yes. It was in the Merkaz HaKarmel in Haifa, and I remember just that we walked in and there was an older person that tried to get the life insurance. So the story goes that this 100-year-old guy goes to the insurance company and says, I want life insurance, and the clerk laughs at him and says, we don't give life insurance to 100 years old. And he said, that's not true, because my mother is 120, and she insured, so the clerk says she's good. He said, sure, she's good. So he goes to the boss, they think better. They said, you know what? You come on Tuesday and, and we'll be happy to ensure you all the papers will be ready. You just have to sign. And so the old man says, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm busy on Tuesday. They say, what do you have on Tuesday? He said, on Tuesday, my grandfather is getting married. <laughs> How old is your grandfather? 150. 150, he wants to get married. He said, he doesn't want to, but his parents put lots of <laughs> So there's my optimism, Steve. And it's true, they just a little bit, you know, I don't know what you But, but we, are, uh, we are definitely optimistic. So, what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend maybe five minutes on this slide and tell you what I'm going to tell you and then just show you real fast examples. And, and you see in red, I have challenges of using big, big data. That's with you some in mind, so I'll, I'll make this thing. But the first thing I want to say and was mentioned here, you know, the mice were terrible models for age-related diseases. The DBDB is not the diabetes, the Alzheimer's is not the Alzheimer. Uh, we really failed with models. By the way, part of failing the models is we use young animals to study heart disease and Alzheimer and other things. This is crazy. <laughs> you know, you, you, you use the model not for without the risk of the biology of age. And so the question is, we're, we're claiming that, hey, every animal is aging the same, and that's our advantage. But uh, is it really true? Are we depicting the mechanisms uh, in animals as we're depicting them, uh, are we depicting in humans like in animals? The second thing, if you want to develop a drug now, the pharmaceuticals will want every genetic evidence from humans. The PCSK9, if you follow this new class of drug for hyperlipidemia, was all done by human studies. The, the biologists never came with this idea. Uh, the, there was a studies on gain of function of people who had this mutation and, and loss of function, and they developed the drug. The mice came just to test the drugs. It came much later. So do we have example, genetic examples that are relevant to aging? That's number two. Number three is we started looking at the biology, the biology of aging, and, and it's really important because why the FDA wants that before even talking about aging? Because if you are 50 years old and you have a test that shows you are 40 years old, you don't need to do colonoscopy, right? But if you are 60 years old, really, biologically, you should have. We have to have these biomarkers, but for us in the field, the biomarkers are important because uh, we want to see, we, we need biomarkers not only that will tell us what's the biological and chronological age, but will affect our treatment, we'll, we'll use the treatment because, like, like you use cholesterol as, as a biological marker for treatment, like you use blood pressure as a, as a, a treatment, uh, as a biological marker. <coughs> so, so there's a very practical thing about it. Now, I'm going to show you lots, lots of things on, on big data. I want to say just one thing. And, and actually, I had two people who came to me already and said, how do you, how do you deal with big data? It's such a headache. And, and it is a headache. And we have to really, really work hard with the people. It's different to be a biologist and to be a computational person. And what I found initially always is that, you know, we're looking for a needle in a haystack. It doesn't make sense to increase the haystack, <laughs> okay? That's a lot of what happened. And if you don't have the right question, you're not going to write to get the right answer. So there's a lot of challenges here. I talked with Sami a lot about here, and he knows, and he has a plan of how to uh, get over it. Okay. So let me introduce you for understanding the data I'm going to show this population that I have. 
Um, those are four siblings that were born um, between 1910 and 1920 in New York City. And what's unique about them, they all became over the age of 100. Um, she was, uh, she died at 110, uh, doesn't show here, 110, um, 100 and, 107, 109, and 100 and, 102. Uh, she actually smoked for over 90 years, two packs of cigarette smoking. When I asked her, none of you doctor told you to stop smoking? She said, all four doctors that told me to stop smoking, they died. <laughs> and, and the lesson could be either if we smoke 90 years, we live long life. But really what I want you to remember, those people are resilient. They actually haven't done anything right in the environment as a group, not in food, not in body weight, not in exercise, and not in smoking, okay? So this is unique people, and I have three, 700 centenarians, you know, and I have their offspring, and, and in a big study that, by the way, it's all Ashkenazi Jews for genetic uh, reasons. So this is kind of the study I have. And the first important thing to know, the question is, did they get all sick when everybody gets sick and now they're living sick for a long period of time, or were they healthy? And this is the answer, and the answer comes from two studies. Um, Tom Pearls is the black and red, and our study is the green and blue. And what you see here is not the lifespan, but the health span for those diseases. And you see, for example, here in our study that, that they live 20, 30 years more healthy. Okay, so it's not only the lifespan, it's the health span too. In fact, at age 80, only 10% of our subjects didn't have any diseases, and over the age of 100, almost 30% of our subjects didn't have disease. They're like what you described with your father, didn't wake up uh, one day. So the point is, we have this population, we have this ability to get to 100. Why do we die at the age of 80? I would just say we have, a, a, before thinking of, you know, extending lifespan more, we already uh, have the proof that we as a human species can get there. But this is even not the interesting part. The interesting part is that those guys, those, those guys here, uh, they, they get sick in a very short time before they die. There is a contraction of morbidity. And this contraction of morbidity has been analyzed by the CDC actually every year since 19, uh, this is 1993. And basically they show that the last two years of medical cost of someone who died after the 100 is third of that who dies uh, at the age of 70. So this is part of this longevity dividend. If you're healthy, it's going to be well. By the way, those people uh, in my study, when they were 70, they didn't go to the doctor. It wasn't part of their routine either. So this is the longevity period. Okay, so the first question that I ask is, are we humans, are, are, are we using the same biology that those mice are using or some other uh, animals? And uh, this is Zen Dong Zhang, who really came from the computational. I have such, such a great relation with him because now we're both talking the same language. It takes the time, but we're talking the same language. And, and what we have is we have exome sequencing of 2,500 people among the our centenarians. Huge, huge amount of data, 100 million uh, uh, data points. Um, and uh, in the exome sequencing, there are still 100,000 differences between people with longevity and control. So what he's, what he's done, he started by looking at the genetic uh, differences between control and people with longevity. And that's the regular genotype. It's called the burden test when we do it here. But we didn't stop there. What we said, just a minute, we're not built of single uh, variants, okay, at a time. We actually, those variants come in a network. So let's actually look at the networks of where the variants are, rather than leave them all on their own, and look at the impact of the network. And that's not enough. We wanted to see if the network is a biological significance 
So we, met, we, we integrated also our biological knowledge into the genetics and into the network. And the, the, the final result is this. When we looked at the enrichment of pathways in longevity, the first things that we get are MAP kinase, insulin IGF signaling pathway, and mTOR signaling pathway. In other words, we got exactly what we know we have in mice, okay? Now, the question now is, but this is not enough to develop drugs, so the question is, do we have single examples, cluster examples of how this works? And by the way, based on our finding, there are already two drugs that have phase three trials in humans. One is the CTP inhibitors and one is an apoc 3 inhibitors that, was, that came from our study, but let me, let me show you an example of how it works. So the growth from an IGF signaling pathway is kind of interesting because the small dogs live longer and the ponies live longer and the nematodes with the mutation live longer and the growth hormone mice that have a lot of growth hormone, they die, they die shortly and those that are deficient die on and so on and so on. In humans, when we look at the IGF-1 level, okay, that's the peripheral growth hormone level, when we look at the IGF-1 level, in our, human, uh, in our female centenarians, look, they have, they have the lowest level in green, live twice as long. And again, this was mainly a female effect, and not a male effect, right? One of the examples. So, uh, Gilad Small it came to me like more than a decade ago, and he said, look, we observed something really interesting. There's the deletion of exome 3 growth hormone receptor, and there are 12% of them in our centenarians. I said, that's really great. What, what's, the, what's their IGF level? He said, you know, the IGF-1 level is low. I said, that's a really great thing. What's their height? What was their maximum height? He said, that's the problem. They were taller. They were much taller. So I said to, I said to Bill, I, I don't know what to do with this data. You know, it's probably, you know, just, I don't know, but I don't know what to do with this data. Give me what to do with the data. I did four replication studies. And each one of the, in each one of those replication studies, uh, he got that the people who live longest had significantly more, more deletion in the growth hormone receptor. So what is the mechanism? Why are they taller? Then we sent our samples to Hasi Cohen, who is an IGF expert. And what he looked, he first looked at the activation of the growth hormone receptor in serum, where it wasn't very activated. The, the, the activation was low. Uh, but when he incubated it with lots of growth hormone, the, the, the activation was higher. Not only that, it worked with proliferation as well. It was lower without adding anything, and with lots of growth hormone, it was higher. Now, what exactly is going on, mechanistically, we're not sure, but when those people go through puberty and growth hormone is high, they grow taller. Something happened in the activation of this receptor and it's higher. But when growth hormone goes down, their IGF-1 level is lower, and that's why they have longevity. What do we do about it? Well, it happened that a lot of pharmaceuticals have developed IGF receptor antibody to treat cancer. They failed. But there's human studies with IGF receptor. And we went to Amgen, and Amgen modernized for us those uh, antibodies. You just deliver them by shot once a week. And we took older mice, they would be like 60, 70 years old, and, in few, and, and gave them a treatment of a IGF-1 antibody, and as you've seen, their longevity increased by almost 10%. Um, and it was in fem we did it in female only, because in males, the mute doesn't affect their health span. But what really was amazing, their health span was much more dramatically affected than their lifespan. Um, their cardiac function, their stolic cardiac function improved, their excess capacity, improve the sensory motor function. And please remember, that's another example that it's never too late to treat aging. Okay, we have to remember it and say uh, all the time. So, by the way, 60% of our centenarians, sorry, have something in the Rosamon IGF receptor pathway. Okay, something about biomarkers. Um, 
So um, we use a sonomer. Um, so the technology is interesting. I'm going to skip it. But they measure 5,000 proteins at once in 1,000 hour subject that are between the ages 65 and 95. 5,000 proteins. Again, huge data to deal with. And when you get those data, the first thing you do is the volcano plot, just for the more novice here. Those uh, volcanoes plot, think of there, there's a mountain and there's lava coming out of the volcano. So that's the red, okay? And it goes high. The, the highest it goes, the more statistical uh, significant it is. This is 10 to the minus 80, okay, up here. And the farthest that it goes, the more effective it is. So BNP, the effect, is much higher. But basically, what you see here is many biomarkers that are going up, some that are going down. And what's interesting, most of them we have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea. We're looking for biomarkers. And in fact, the biomarkers that we were using, like IL-6, doesn't come as significant. Okay? Very, very different profile and, and a terrific opportunity. So the question is, uh, what, what are those pathways now? What are those, what, what are we measuring here as far as classes? And this is the, the first, so that's the keg here. And the first thing that's coming is, is again the insulin like growth factor, okay? It again comes as the top. But then there's a surprise. What comes next is mainly breakdown and degradation, okay? There is the uh, extracellular metric organization, the regulation of extracellular metrics, platelet degranulation, collagen degradation, collagen formation, non-profit degranulation, and so on and so on. It's the breakthrough in aging. And I was initially a little bit, uh, you know, upset because I wanted to see the mechanism, but actually, I think if we have effective therapy, okay, what we should see is the decrease in the breakdown. I think it might actually be a great biomarker for, for uh, any, anything that stops uh, aging. Now, really small vignettes just to show you how powerful it is. So those thousand people that I told you the Volcano store, 500 are offspring of centenarians and 500 are control. Those are the control. If, if you can see, I don't know how good you see, but they're not as red as those. Okay, mm -hmm. and the reason is they're aging slower. Okay, in fact, they're losing 379 proteins because they're really less than 65, 95 biologically. But one of the interesting things is the offspring of centenarians, those are auto, have 29 significant proteins that are known to be protective actually. Among them, the serum protein 17, vitam 1, and alpha cloto. So we actually can discover protective mechanism in the offspring of centenarians. Uh, sex differences are amazing. Now see, this is the interesting part. The proteome of the females, what they have in common, it's much more stable. I, I mean, males have a lot, and females have them, but much lower. And then females have their own stuff. Okay, so we have to think of why the proton is more stable in female, and that's, that's going to be actually a good way to go with this uh, data that we have. And obviously what we want to do with this data is we want to have a predictive tool um, that will tell us the biological age and the chronological age. So, for example, here, this guy is actually 91, but he's biologically like 100 and he died within a year. Uh, this is ju just an example, but those tools, and I think Steve will give us a, a little bit be better feeling. Those two are important, but the most important thing for us that this tool shows us that biological aging predicts mortality better than chronological aging or frailty. There's another really cool thing that but the frail people in the study don't look at all like the aging people. They have their own biomarkers of frailty, which I think is another interesting thing that will come up. Will come up. Okay, so how much do I have? Uh, six. Terrific. Um, so what are the challenges to translate all our knowledge uh, from animal and in humans 
Well, in other areas, in, in any other disease, you do a biological discovery, you do your biotech, uh, you develop the drug, you target it, and, and you know, if you have a drug for hypertension, the pharmaceutical will say, let's find another drug for hypertension, another mechanism, we'll make another drug, we'll make other money. So what, what is the problem? Well, the problem is that in a lot of the regulation bodies around the world, aging is not a disease, okay? And by the way, I'm not suggesting it will be a disease. We actually solve the problem without causing a disease. Not because we don't have to look at it this way, but we don't have to call it this way because of ageism. But, but you know, if, if, if aging is not a disease, then the healthcare providers are, are, do not have to pay their clients in order to use, right, lapomycin, right? They don't have to, to do that. Well, if the healthcare providers are not doing that, the pharmaceuticals are not going to jump in and develop those drugs and better drugs and combination of drugs because they need the business plan. So how do we get over it? Well, we use a metformin as a tool. And a, I just want to make a, a big point. I'm going to show you what metformin is doing. By the way, those are the hallmarks of aging. And it looks like metformin is hitting all, all the, all the uh, hallmarks of aging. And they do it in some way, but I, I think what we see here is something really interesting that's common to all the drugs that target aging. It started with the sirtuins and rapamycin and, and everything. When you fix the aging on the cellular level, it looks like you fixed everything. It doesn't mean that that's how it happened, but they, when the cell became young, again, everything, and the fights that we have are, people say, no, but it does that, and that's how it does it. Well, it does everything because it deals with energy, uh, just as a sideline. But anyhow, sorry, but anyhow, uh, metformin extends lifespan and health span in animals, and not only that, but because metformin has been 60 years around, there are studies that shows, clinical studies, that shows that it delays diabetes in non-diabetic people, in diabetic people it delays cardiovascular disease, that there's hundreds of studies that shows that people on metformin have less cancers, all kinds of cancers. Metformin delays a cognitive decline and Alzheimer in non-type 2 di diabetes. And also, there's a less mortality in people that take metformin then in people who don't have diabetes, 17% less mortality in people with diabetes that are more obese, more sick to begin with than, than non people. So metformin is a generic, it's cheap, it's safe, and, and we thought it could be a tool to target aging. And we, and when I say we, is Steve and uh, Jay was with us. We basically went to the FDA after considering this trial that's going to start soon, it's called TAM, Taming Aging with Metformin. And we sat with the FDA and we first said, you know, we want to prove the concept that aging can be targeted. And we told them how we're going to do that. We're going to have a composite of age-related disease we're calling, <laughs> that we're calling aging. But really, the point was that it, the study is designed so that the FDA will be satisfied. Mm -hmm. that in the end, since FDA doesn't need, need to give us permission to do that, but the FDA has to be satisfied that when we're coming there, they don't tell us, you should have done something else. Okay, so we got their comment and we integrated the comment. And, and we basically have a green light from the FDA from this perspective, and this is before we're talking with Ed Sharpless, who's a biologist of aging that's going to at the FDA, so I'm very optimistic. So, uh, to summarize, human have capacity to have increased uh, uh, health span, uh, right? The centenarians do. The mechanism of aging longevity in humans are similar, not totally the same, but a lot similarity, so we can use animal models very nicely. A development of biomarkers, I think, is crucial to really help us. I mean, it would be nice to have short-term studies with drugs to see the effects on biomarkers before we do the definitive study. So I think this will be great. Um, and uh, I, I think there are already drugs out, out there that uh, uh, people are taking that can be targeted. I'm not 
suggesting to do that, but aging uh, can be targeted. And I think every country, that's why we're doing around the world, needs to assure that there's a regulation for the prevention of age-related diseases. We have to make sure that everybody knows that we will do this effort tomorrow at the end of the Congress. It has to be a regulation and then I think we're, uh, we really can make a big advance. Now, I don't know if you know uh, Jim Croce, in that says they need, but there's a beautiful song, uh, Tiny in a Bottle. I don't know if I can play it here, but basically that's what we're doing. We want to get uh, Tiny in a Bottle. And the nice thing is uh, that then we can spend them uh, together with you, and this will be fun. Thank you very much. Just one theoretical question. Thank you for your amazing presentation and your amazing studies. Absolutely mind-blowing. But age is just one of the dimension of time. Age means what you have time and you have some units of time. From your point of view, what's units of biological time? Uh, what is I'm, a ticking in our body? I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure if you're asking me a physical, no. a, a physical, a, you know, no physical. the second law of thermodynamic question or, no. No, or biological an accumulated question. thing with time. Hmm? I, I, I'll tell you the time, what happens with time. You know, I, I remember in medical school reading that the American soldiers that died in Vietnam had atherosclerosis. But atherosclerosis is a very dynamic Thing. The, the, you, can have, you can accumulate plaques and you can decrease the plaques and, it, and, and you're not accumulating very uh, much during aging uh, until you're age 60 and then you accumulate them more. So there are some things that accumulate with age but actually most of how our body work is, is we can deal, up, deal with the breakdown or the changes in aging. So time is not even linear for all the processes. It becomes much different with aging. It's not a linear through age 20. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but maybe we can talk no. later. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you know any use in the progression of the TAME study, uh, target and aging with metformin? Which study? TAME, target aging with oh. metformin. Do I know what? Uh, any news from this study? Well, well, uh, the news, first of all, American Federation of Aging Research is leading this effort. Uh, we have a, we, a longer story, but we initially wanted the government to be involved, but that's not going to happen because what the FDA wants and what the government wants are two different things. And we have a, a non-for-profit organization that have to declare themselves, uh, and they're they're going to support TAME. We hope that it will be soon. We hope to launch it at the end of the year or beginning of, of next year. Um, and just uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cross in for the news. I, I, I think it will happen. The question is when. <laughs> I just want some more information. There are more than 95 laws and because of diabetes, I started six years ago Taking that for me every day, and I've been taking it for the last 15 years. Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> you, show, you show something else. You have quite a lot of achievements, and I, I claim that good farming had parts in that too. <laughs> and on that note, thank you for the uh, presentation.
beside him and when he's being Besides that, David is a professor of Harvard Medical School, the father of genetics. He made tremendous revolutions in our ability to take the knowledge from the lab into the clinic and they suggest, and the company will speak about it, several molecules that can be used as a drug to treat aging and to improve healthy aging. Thank you.
the derivative of, some, of something very fundamental. And what I think is going on is that, that aging is a loss of information. Uh, we live in an information age, we know what happens when information uh, is subject to noise um, or gets lost over time. Uh, we don't get emails, um, we have uh, screwed up um, compact disks of, of using old technology. And if you think about what type of information could be lost in a, in a cell, there are really only two main types of information. There are other minor components, structural components, but the main types of information, uh, the one that we all know about, uh, everybody knows about pretty much, uh, is the genome. the genome. This is a digital form of information. Uh, it's base four rather than binary, uh, but it's got four bases in there. They're either one or four essentially one of four letters. And that's a digital form. It's probably the reason why uh, life used it in the first place, because digital information is extremely um, robust. high fidelity. It's easy to replicate. Uh, you don't lose information as you copy it, uh, typically. And that's the reason that we switched to digital in the first place. But there's another type of information in our cells that's just as important for life. Without it, we will be dead uh, very quickly. In fact, we would not be have gone beyond being a fertilized egg. Uh, and that's what we generally refer to as the epigenome. Uh, another way to think of it is it's the, the system that leads the digital information. Um, and for many reasons, uh, that's analog format. Um, one of the reasons the epigenome has to be largely analog is that it has to change constantly. As I breathe in this air, you breathe in air as you have a cup of coffee, your epigenome is adjusting, and I use epigenome broadly to mean transcription as well as um, longer term methylation patterns that we'll hear from Steve Korbach about later. But essentially, these structures that wrap up the DNA and tell which genes to turn on and off, when and how, uh, is critical, I think, for the long term survivability of an individual. Um, and people were studying epigenome initially. The term epigenome comes from Conrad Waddington, who realized that. Because every cell in our bodies is essentially genetically identical, there has to be a system to tell a cell what it is during embryo development and differentiation. But those people who studied embryonic development didn't think much about the end of life. But I'm, the more I study uh, yeast and now mammals, the more I realize that Waddington was onto something. Um, and it's just as important to understand what preserves that original developmental, uh, I wouldn't call it program, but preserves the, the identity of cells throughout our lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, another way to think about <clears throat> aging is to look at what people have done over the years about preserving information. And uh, if you just Google uh, information it's preservation, yeah. uh, you'll undoubtedly come across this person. Uh, yeah. He was Shannon. He worked in the 1930s. Um, in 1940, 1940s, he proposed a couple of papers. It was in uh, this uh, Bell System Technical Journal. And this is considered the foundation of information theory that led to the internet um, age that we live in. And uh, this paper titled Mathematical Theory of Communication essentially said that we have, we have a transmitter of information, there's noise that's introduced, and you have a receiver, and you lose that information between two time points. Um, the problem is that if you're an analog system, you're very easily subjected, subjected to noise. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who is old enough to have had a record player or a cassette tape will know that if you copy that, um, it doesn't work that well. Uh, and Claude Shannon was very aware that lost radio signals uh, during World War II led to the loss of many lives. So he came up with a, a theory of how to preserve information from here to here. And what I'm going to propose to you today is the possibility that uh, this is also the case for our bodies over time, and that when we're, we have information laid down during embryogenesis, and then of course when we're very young and teenagers, the cells, obviously a nerve cell stays a nerve cell for most of its time, hopefully, um, and a liver cell knows it's a liver cell, and the progeny also know that they've come from a liver cell, they don't suddenly turn from a liver cell into a neuron. Um, but over time, this information I think is lost, and I have some evidence that that is true. This is also from that paper. It's one of the most interesting papers I've ever read. And what he, what Claude Shannon showed, 
was that, I apologize for the person who's trying to put my screen where I can see it down there. Um, what he showed is that there's a way to preserve information if it's, if it's lost. And what you do is you have what he's calling the observer. Today we call that the backup uh, repository of information. And what you do if you have a backup is you can go and get that information if it's lost. And that's actually the way the internet works. And this is how uh, Tim Berners, uh, the design of the internet. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that now, but it's essentially the same. And the question that we are asking in my lab is, what is the, if there is noise that leads to aging, what is that? And can we cause aging by introducing what we now call epigenetic noise, the epigenetic drift and the loss of cellular identity and function. But also, more recently, uh, working with some people in the room as well as uh, many people around the world, is, is it possible to retrieve that information from a backup drive in the cell? Is there a repository of youthful epigenetic status in a cell? And if there is, how do you access that? without either screwing up the cell or causing it to become a tumor cell. How do we get that correction data back again? Uh, so I mentioned compact discs. Uh, I've been using this slide uh, for a while now to teach medical students. They're getting so young now that uh, some of them have never even seen a compact disc before. <laughs> I've explained to them we used to put music on these things. <clears throat> but it's a really good analogy as to what I'm trying to explain, which is that our genome is digital. Um, but the epigenome is, is, is the reader, an analog reader, and it's similar to getting scratches on the CD so that our cells, if this were a cell, just cannot read the right genes at the right time in the right place. And so that the, instead of having a beautiful concerto being played throughout the room, uh, it's, it's all jumping around and it's really quite a, a, a cacophony. But can you polish that CD and get back the original symphony of the cell? Okay, so that's enough analogies. Let's get down to some molecular biology now. Um, this is actually a really old slide. I, I, I use it because it's, 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 I can't do better than this. It comes from uh, Shin Emai and Kitano from 1998. And this is representing the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. The black lines are chromosomes, and uh, the, the red lines are uh, genes being read. And uh, if I can get the cursor here. And then uh, these are silent genes. And the reason that uh, Shin and I get to draw this diagram was we were currently, at that time, um, and I was in my lab with Shin, we were making these, what turned out to be great breakthroughs in understanding why yeast cells stay young and don't die immediately, uh, but also why they grow old. And what we found was there were two things that go wrong in yeast cells. One is uh, there's a lot of genomic instability that distract these proteins that silence genes. We now know some of these uh, proteins as sirtuins, sir standing for silent information regulator. Interesting that that word information has been in the field for a long time. We just haven't really talked about information as much as we probably should. Um, but over, over time, you can see that these silencing proteins, the genes that epigenomic regulators, have moved away for some reason. Uh, and now genes that were once off are coming on and vice versa. And this cell has lost a lot of its identity and function. So the question we've had for a while is um, what drives these changes and does that underlie any aspect of aging? Now in yeast, it's turned out it only took us a couple of years to figure that out. I, I really miss yeast. We could do an experiment, a uh, lifestyle experiment in a week as opposed to a few years. <clears throat> so what we managed to figure out pretty quickly was that one of the main drivers of, of this change in the epigenomic status of a yeast cell uh, are double strand DNA breaks in the chromosome. Now these are happening all the time in our body. Uh, there's a few trillion in our bodies every day. Each cell gets at least a few. And these are happening all the time. You cannot prevent them even if you live in a lead box at one direction. Um, it's part of life. And what we discovered, at least in yeast, was that these proteins here that should be uh, maintaining silencing uh, actually move, move away and help repair DNA breaks and that distracts them for a while. And what we think is now, after many years of work, is that this distraction uh, prevents them from fully resetting the epigenetic status of the cell. It's like a, a tennis match. <clears throat> so just to, to summarize a lot of work, I want to just uh, show you a movie. Let's see if I can start. 
started. These are a couple of papers that led to this hypothesis. Uh, you can see some of the factors that are involved in this movement of quantum factors away from where they should be. Um, we've got the Sotillings down here. Uh, Chaim is going to talk about Sotil 6. Uh, we've worked on Sotil 1 with Rafa for many years as well. Uh, okay, so these are quantum factors, and you'll see what happens in this diagram. on, cuts are initiated in the DNA. With many breaks happening, repair proteins are very busy, and this is an issue. With each successive fix, the proteins don't always return to their original locations, and the chromatin structures at the repair locations don't always reset to their original tightness. Actually, okay, sorry for that, uh, but that, that basically shows what we're trying to say, in, that's in a one-dimensional slash two-dimensional realm. We're actually, obviously, our cells are in four dimensions. We have a much better idea now of what's going on. Why would the cell do this? Why would the cell take a silencing protein or a transcription factor that's doing a perfect job over here and move it to a DNA break? Well, we think the system evolved to coordinate DNA repair with the response, the transcriptional response. Um, if you have a broken chromosome, the last thing you should be doing is, is mating if you're a yeast cell uh, or dividing if you're a mammalian cell. And we can, we can actually... Uh, see that those genes that change when you create a DNA break are those that are involved in stress responses and DNA repair. But we think over time this leads to a loss of epigenomic uh, information. So if this is right, if you create DNA breaks in a cell or in an animal, you should accelerate the aging clock and you should get uh, an animal that is older than it otherwise would be. Um, and it should, shouldn't just happen to one part of the mouth or one part of the the cell that should happen across the board. <clears throat> so we developed a mouse that, that we could do that in. It took us many years. We started the project uh, a decade ago. We used an enzyme that cuts DNA in human cells and in mice that doesn't create mutations. So uh, we sequence these cells and we sequence these mice uh, to great depth and there are no mutations that we can find either at these cut sites or elsewhere. Um, it cuts about, it recognizes about 20 sites in the genome, um, and it, with one exception, they're all in non coding regions. But again, no mutations. So now we can separate the changes to the epigenome from actual mutations themselves. And uh, we know that some of these factors, so one, HTAC1, go to these breaks caused by this enzyme. This enzyme comes from a slime mold, so we just put it in the mouse. Uh, and was able to turn it on with tamoxifen. Um, so it's a complex system, but basically if we give uh, the mouse that has a complete system, which we call ICE, for inducible changes to the epigenome, we can turn on the cuts, uh, we can see the cuts occurring in cells, we can see them occurring in tissues, we can then turn off the system and ask the question what happens. This is an experimental setup. Uh, we turn on the cutting uh, for just three weeks, when the mouse is young, and then we turn it off again, we let the mouse age after that normally, and have a look what happens over their lifespan, actually over the next 16 months. Uh, some of the things that could have happened are uh, nothing, cancer, uh, or immediate death. And, but what's important to know about this system is it's not creating mutations, so we didn't expect to get cancer, we didn't see any um, acceleration of cancer, but beyond what you'd expect from a and a mouse of its, of its biological age. Um, and we didn't get uh, any death. In fact, the mice didn't even feel it. We couldn't tell any difference in their behavior. Or uh, if anything, they lost a little bit of weight, we think, because of the drug. But they regained it quickly. Uh, so after 16 months uh, of age, this is 10 months after the treatment, the mice that had been treated, all of them looked extremely different. Two new controls. Uh, you can see the ice mice on the right. Uh, have symptoms that I want to say are aging but certainly resemble aging. Um, we have <clears throat> about seven years of data. This is just a snapshot of changes in uh, weight, in respiration, in bone density, uh, kyphosis. But what I think is most important, because I can tell you that these look like old mice as much as, uh, as much as I want, but you could always say, well, that's just a sick mouse. It just 
has very old looking tissues. It's not true aging. And you'd be right. You'd say there's no way we can prove this is aging. Uh, but then along came Steve Holder, uh, and he said, well, I've got an independent measure of age that isn't dependent on how a mouse looks or behaves or its physiology. You just measure its methylation patterns. And if the mouse is older, we can, we can see that. Um, and so some of these experiments were done with Steve, some were done with Fabian Gladyshev's lab. <clears throat> and what we found was that the ice mice, uh, and here we're looking at muscle, we've also done a blood clot, are uh, on average about 50% older based on the DNA methylation uh, slash callback clock. Uh, which is great because this is um, the first e independent evidence that these mice are not just looking old, but are actually older um, biologically. Uh, but it also is an indication that we may have found one of the windings of the clock, that the response to DNA damage and the movement of these factors messes with the epigenome, um, including the DNA methylation patterns across the genome. But now the question, just to finish up uh, in the last part of my talk, is can we bring the age of cells or mice back down? Can we find the backup drive of the epigenome as it was young and restore that? Not just for ice mice, but for regular old mice, essentially polishing that compact disc. <clears throat> so I and many others around the world uh, have stood now on the shoulders of Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize in 2012, for uh, discovering a group of factors now called Yamanaka factors that can turn a somatic cell, say a skin cell, into a pluripotent stem cell so that you can then regenerate tissues and organs. Um, and rightly so, that was a Nobel Prize worthy discovery. We've been looking for many years on how to use factors. We tried nanog, we tried these four factors, um, O, S, K, M, um, short. Uh, and every time we tried it, we got uh, either a tumor or the cells became uh, more uh, oncogenic. So we didn't have a lot of success, but then we had, were inspired by this paper that came out of Del Monte's lab in 2016, uh, where they found that if you just turned on four of those Yamanaka factors, the OSK uh, and M, just for two days a week, those mice not, didn't die, um, they actually lived longer. And this was in a pro mouse model admittedly, these aren't normal mice, but they did live 40% longer. So as, as long as you don't kill the mouse in those experiments, they live longer. Now, I don't recommend you go out and try this therapy. It's pretty dangerous. Uh, if you don't die within a few days, you might get a tumor. So this was more of a proof of concept paper from Belmonte's lab. But what we, um, or my student, Huan Chen Wu, immediately recognized was that uh, CMIC is an oncogene uh, and that's probably not a good thing to be turning on in an animal. So what he did was he worked to build a, a adenovirus where he could infect a mouse uh, with just three of the, of the four Yamanaka factors, O, S, and K. And without meat, we found it wasn't toxic. We put this vector, the viruses, into mice, and the mice were totally healthy. They didn't die, and they haven't grown any tumors over the last year. Now, the drawback of virus uh, treatment, as you probably know, is it's very hard to get an even distribution across an animal. So until we solve that problem, uh, I don't think we're going to be all receiving OSK therapy anytime soon. Uh, but that said, we wanted to try to see if we could reverse the age of a really important tissue with this technology. And uh, Wang Chen decided to go after the central nervous system because he likes a challenge. But the other reason that made scientific sense is that nerve cells lose their ability to regenerate very early in life. Um, a neonate mammal uh, has already lost its ability to regrow an optic nerve if it's crushed, or a spinal cord if it breaks. But if you're extremely young or an embryo, those nerves actually are young enough to regrow. And one chain bravely asked the question, if we reprogram uh, or try to reprogram nerves in a in an adult mouse, or even an old mouse, will they re regain their youthfulness? Can they regrow? Can we get back some function? Versus an adult cell which will just sit and not grow. So the first experiment he did was to, uh, and this was in collaboration with Jibang, his lab at Children's Hospital at Harvard, was to 
you know, in, a, in America would say a Hail Mary pass. This is one that you you go for it and you hope that something works. And it, it, it worked. Uh, the experiment is to crush the back of a mouse's optic nerve uh, mm. and see if it regrows. And this is a gold standard model for uh, neuronal um, regeneration. rejuvenation and ability to regrow. Now, what we're looking at are two pictures. One with a controlled adenovirus, which uh, green fluorescent protein GFP. And this is what you typically see, is that most of the optic nerve dies off. So that orange dye that we put into the eye has vanished. Okay? Most of it, you see a lot of death here in the optic nerve. The brain is back here, uh, about twice the width of this slide. But with the reprogramming, and we, we turn on the reprogramming factors after the crush. This is, you don't have to pre-program pre these cells. And what we see is, not just in young adults, but old adult mice, we see a regrowth of the optic mm -hmm. nerve. And the longer we leave it, the better we get the growth. Uh, if we go, this is a picture, uh, I believe, for, for just for four weeks, the first experiment. So we've gone for 16 weeks now, and many of these nerves um, do reach the brain. Now, we haven't tested vision in, in these mice um, because we've been harvesting those optic nerves and looking at the clock with Steve, and actually with, with Steve, we found that those optic nerves are younger based on the DNA methylation clock. So it does look like we can reverse the age of cells in vitro. What you also, uh, in vivo. What you also might ask is, well, what's happening with the crush? Well, actually, we've got evidence that the crush is accelerating uh, the methylation clock. So it's early days, but maybe, maybe think about this, that perhaps injury is deleterious in part because it accelerates the age of a cell. And that reprogramming could also protect us against that. We can, uh, in collaboration with Bruce, Bruce Cassandra, also in Boston, his lab showed that if we reprogram mice that have been uh, given glaucoma, which is pressure-induced damage to the retina, we can then take a dysfunctional retina, these are uh, um, measures of retinal function with an electrocardiogram, essentially, this a retinogram. Uh, you can see it after treatment, just after four weeks, we've got reversal of the loss of function. Measuring that, we can also measure whether a mouse can now see again, uh, and the answer is, uh, yeah, at least partially we can, in this blue line, we can mm. reverse uh, glaucoma. So there's nothing for the glaucoma right now, except uh, slowing the progression of the disease, and here we're getting vision back. And then finally, what about old mice? <coughs> in this experiment, we turned, uh, we, we programmed these cells and we actually got vision back in old mice, as good as a young mouse. Very uh, quickly, we've, we've done um, molecular analyses of these cells. Very hard to do that on our optic nerve, but we can see a restoration of gene expression patterns. Interestingly, we see that many of the genes that are restored are, are related to olfactory receptors. And we don't understand that now, but those red dots are an abundance of olfactory receptors. That's guiding those neurons. And then finally, uh, we want to get to mechanisms, so the TET proteins, there are three TET proteins that are essential for removing uh, DNA methylation. And if we block TET2 or TET1, we do not get the reprogramming, we do not get the restoration of eyesight. And in vitro, we can see we do not get the improvement in axonal growth, um, as quantified down here on the bottom of that. So we think that that's part of the mechanism, is the re resetting of the, the DNA methylome. And so going back to Shannon, um, what I'm proposing to you is that a, a young cell is similar to the transmitter. The receiver is our cells in the future as we get older. DNA damage, double strand break particularly, is a large source of noise to disrupt the epigenome. There are probably many others, including metabolic disturbances, other things that we know accelerate aging. OSK is one way of receiving correction data. We don't know who the observer is, we don't know where that information is stored. It could be on the DNA, it could be on the proteins, on the histones, we're looking for that. What are the implications of summary? Uh, perhaps mutations are not a major driver of aging, but actually it's the response to those DNA damage uh, events. Uh, a loss of what I'm calling epigenetic resilience over time provides a really nice link between DNA damage, gene expression, and cellular dysfunction. We see actually when we stain these cells and look at them at molecularly, they're losing their identity and the OSK restores that cellular identity and function. These ice mice might be a good model for humans. 
Uh, we, are, we have a nice mouse, which is aging the brain epigenetically, and <coughs> perhaps that's a better predictor of whether a drug will work in a human or not. Uh, this can explain why treatments that damage DNA seem to accelerate aging as well as progenitors. The whole gas clock is uncalling it, uh, maybe more than just a clock, it may actually be participating in the aging process. Uh, and perhaps aging is more reversible than we thought, so that <coughs> we can uh, maybe naturally we max out at 117, 122, uh, the same way we maxed out at running speeds. But perhaps, just as with running, we then move to horses, then to cars, then to trains, then to rockets, we may be on that path now. Mm -hmm. um, and so here's that man, my father at 80, wow. who literally is healthier and fitter than I am, which probably isn't saying that much. <coughs> but, uh, but we're very proud of, of him and people like him who show us what life can be possible for at least them, and hopefully one day for many, many others. Um, and thank many, many people who've made this possible. I just missed a few and I've mentioned them along the way. Thank okay. you. you. I think, I assume that you talked about this uh, signaling or that mechanism where you regenerate or cause uh, remethylation, which is biochemical. But are you aware of any uh, like bioelectric or energy-based physical mechanism to achieve the same? To reset the, the cell. Yeah. Uh, we're not. I, I, this is, this is new data, so we still have a lot to work on. Uh, I think where you're, I, I don't know if you all heard the question, but it's, is there a, another means, so perhaps a physical one, to reset the cell? Now, I don't know about physical, uh, but I think we we're all familiar with the term hormesis that yep. doesn't kill you, mm -hmm. you make longer. Um, I think that that's likely involved. So the sirtuins, we, we studied that for 20 years, the hormesis effect. Good question. If we if we induce either uh, rapamycin enter pathway, NPK or tuins or all of the above, does that help delay this loss of information? Can it trigger the resetting? We don't know. I think given all that we've seen in the field so far, um, nothing's as powerful as this reprogramming. I've never seen even rapamycin reset a retina so that it could work again. I don't know if anyone's actually looked. But uh, I think we're into new territory. I think of this reset as different layers. We have transcription factors that are pretty easy to reset, do exercise, do fasting. We have very strong drugs, uh, rapamycin being <coughs> a, a precursor to them, gets to a different layer. But this clock at the bottom is a very deep layer that we're finally accessing through these gene therapies, and hopefully one day through uh, some other types of molecules that aren't as difficult or expensive. Read this pattern. Yeah, we haven't you tried what? pulsing it. Read this pattern. Yeah, we, we have it's all protected by patterns. It doesn't describe it. No. The OSK has worked so well for us so far. Um, but maybe there are things that OSK cannot do that we need me for. Um, we don't know what those are yet. We have many, many tissues to try to see what we can now rejuvenate. Um, we just started with the retina and it worked. Thank you for uh, the fantastic talk. Um, if I'm thinking about uh, translation of your research into uh, therapy for humans, uh, do you think that using a kind of virus uh, to produce, to transfect all cells in the body? or only certain uh, tissue, and also whether you think that it would be uh, feasible to do it in the vivo or, or ex vivo? Um. Yeah, all good questions. Uh, it's the technology you could imagine is useful not just in vivo, but ex vivo. You take an old liver from an old person who's died. She puts. You know, make it 20 years old again and give it to a new person. And keep recycling organs that way. It's possible. Um, also, rejuvenating cells that you take uh, out of people, build, build new young skin out of the body. Uh, can we target the virus to specific cells? 
Absolutely, there are now adenoviruses that infect different tissues and different cell types. Uh, we chose a virus, um, it's an AAV2 system that targets the retinal ganglion cells, and that worked. Um, but I think the future is that we will have viruses and eventually small molecules that will target specific cell types and tissues. I think eventually, maybe within our lifetimes, there will be molecules or technologies that can be used safely throughout the body. Um, I hope so. I think that's what at least this, this, uh, these results are pointing towards. But it, right now it's a proof of principle. Uh, just to finish up on that question, we are aiming towards having a clinical trial to treat clock on the patients in the next couple of years and uh, working hard towards that. I'd like to add a comment. There is a company in San Diego called Samumed, and they're actually in phase three for uh, arthritis. And their treatment is based on the wind signaling pathway. And they have very good results. So for those who are interested, this is another effort going on right now in humans. Yes, yeah, I mean, Samumed, we'll talk about this tomorrow, but it's this more than a dozen companies that are in clinical trials. So it's a really exciting time that wind signaling is particularly interesting because it's also an upstream mm -hmm. regulator of some of these pathways. So I'm sure there's some overlap there. Thank you very much. Um, typically, that's what... They, they triggered those cells because this is like the memory. Yeah, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This person with the worst. Now we talk about 76. One of the symptoms I said David spoke about before. Before we started, I'm not saying to the student, we really did this uh, study. And these are the students that did the study that I'm going to present today. If you want to ask anything about the study, the simple So I'm going to talk about how 36 affect our energy balance, how 36 help to preserve our ability to be more active as we age, but also I'm going to talk about what are the targets of 36 and I'm going to expand our knowledge listening to orders in regard to the targets. When we talk about aging, when we ask what's regulate healthy aging, if you take all of the known theory, you can summarize into two. You need to maintain your genome to, be, to have a good uh, maintenance of the cell of the body. You also need to have a proper metabolic balance. And we try to find something that connects between maintenance and repair, you can also call it genome stability, metabolism into aging. And we work from the 36, which I will explain in a second what exactly 36 is. 36 is an enzyme. It's part of the circular family of enzyme, and they usually they use molecules called NAD, and there's mm -hmm. one activity, there are two nematic activity. One, they can remove a steel group or a steel group from a protein, and by this affects its activity. And the other activity that children have, that they can take the ADP ribose from NAD and conjugate it to another protein, and by this also affects its activity. If you ask what cell is, is doing, you can see it here. It's involved in many processes which are involved in aging, like DNA repair. It's involved in a double stem break repair, basic signal repair. It's involved in glucose metabolism, obesity, fat metabolism, general maintenance. We can find 36 sit together with the protein, which is also involved in aging on the telomere and determine the telomere length. We found that under dietary restriction, procedures that can extend lifespan, the level of 36 increase, it's repressed the translocation of retro transposal elements at the junction of DNA element from one location to another location in the genome. It's involved in inflammation, it's a cutting flow, Barburg effect, Barburg effect is the effect that responds to the tumor cells by using a, a different type of, a, of a different, they take the glucose and, and they do not complete, it's a conversion into the TCA cycle, they just make it into part of it, and by this, you do it again and again. And also, it's a, if you have a knockout in 36, if a, a human, they die before death, 
And if you create a monkey that misses surfaces, the mutation surfaces, they die a few hours after birth. In regard to aging, when we show one result in two seconds, we show that cell 6 is involved in aging, and actually, when you overexpress it, you get a significant effect on, health, on aging and healthy age. And if we go back to the enzymatic activity of cell 6 as the articulates, the question that we ask is whether all the activities that we see for cell 6 are just because its activity is hist on the articulates, right? It's activity of removing acetyl group from the chromatins that surrounding the DNA. If you look at the literature, you can see that in all cases, it's a deacetylase activity of histones, actually a few, very few targets for 36, and you can find it in ADP, sorry, it's in DNA repair and in, a, and in a transposal element stability, there's also involvement of normal ADP oscillation. But besides it, across the literature, 36 is found to act as histone deacetylase. The first question that I'm going to ask, and I'm going to touch later, the all cell 6 phenotype that I just showed before stems from its histone deacetylase activity or the other substrate for cell 6 The first mice model that we, that we created to answer questions regarding the cell 6 is called Moses. It's a more mice overexpressing exogenous cell 6 we, we, we generated this model almost a decade ago. We we're going to show few results that we found about Moses, about other, uh, also about other uh, mice models that over express in 36. It's drawn by my daughter, Avia Cohen, the member of the signature. She's now in Bezalel, but when she draw it, this Bezalel is a uh, art school of physics. And when she draws it, it's 10 years ago. She did some chorus. Okay, so the first one that we follow with regard to 36, what's happening when you have over express in 36? Of course, the and this was published a decade ago, and you can see that over expression 36, male, this is regarding to sex specific effect of aging, only male mice in this background live longer. This is a mixed background, this is a CBC background, which is a mix between black, uh, 67 black, and, uh, and, uh, and another background. And in this case, we have extension of lifespan only in male mice. We didn't see any extension of lifespan in female, and the reason at that time was because. We, we can affect only, we can affect IGF signaling, only men, actually feminine in this background, IGF signaling was already reduced in comparison to, to men. This was published, I'm not going to focus on it. It's also a significant effect helps them. You can see that this for phenotype, one, that they are less diabetic, they do not develop insulin resistant with age, they have improved body composition, they are much more active, and this is very important as we speak about aging, because one of the major the parameter for quality is activity, and last, they have improved long-term memory. But since this was published, I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm going to talk from now on. It's mainly unpublished data. So the first uh, question that we ask, does the effect of cell 6 on lifespan is strain specific? If you're familiar with the aging field, you know that sometimes when you change the background, you lose some of the phenotype you can see in one background, this is the reason why we heard before that we, there was some, some experiment we're doing it in different places of the globe just to be sure that what we see is not position dependent. So what we did, we generated another mice over expressing 36, and this time it was a pure background, it was 67 left. When I say generated, it's mean it's a five years of work. We generate the mice, and then we follow the lifespan, and we have a some addition here is that it's not only overexpressing 36, we create at the same time overexpressing 2 the mice from Amel Serrano that overexpressing 71 at the low level of all, uh, the whole body. And we, we made them with 36 and we follow their lifestyle. And when we did this, you can see that if we look at men, if we just compare between the blue line and the red line, men over, uh, 36 overexpressing mice live almost 30% long, longer and female. 15%. So here we got, again, we've got the differences between the, the genders, but at least under this background, we extend the lifespan in both genders. And in regard to 31, 31, as Manuel Serrano already published, in this background, it's a head of time extension in the beginning, but then closing it, but she and I will be sure that if you overexpress 31 in specific places of the brain, you can get 
expansion of life than in the mice. So what can we say about this mice? I'm not going to show a lot, I'm going to show something which is important for this sleeping, and this is about activity. When we follow the activity, and this is what we, we did, we follow this spontaneous activity, which is running green, we also force them to run on a treadmill, and we just measure how long they run, and what was the distance that they made, and so on. You can see that the dark time is the active time of mice, but we simply see that all the stress in 76 are much more active in comparison to wild type literature. And this is maintained also in old age. And part of the reason is because they are very much more fat. This is what it's called the red. This is a ratio that measure if you if you're burning fat or using sugar. And you can see that at eight months old, 15 and 22 months old, cell six over especially mice burning more fat. What's happening if we force them to run to run? We use a treadmill. Here you can see it again, when it was young or old, if you overexpress what it says, you run for longer and for longer, longer distance. So the mice are more active. So one thing that we can say about the overexpress of they are much more active in comparison to wild type mice. We also have another set of phenotypes regarding the tumors and other, but I would like to answer one question. How cell six be able to maintain its energy? And what we did, we follow the ability of these mice to create glucose even after under fasting. Just to, to give a short background, when we fast, first we use a glucose uh, resources, and then we start a process of called gluconeogenesis that we take okay. precursor within our body, and this is happening in the, mainly in the liver, and we generate again glucose so we can have enough energy to continue our activities. For example, it can happen while we sleep. And what we did here, this is the first, first we follow what's happened to this ability in young and old wild type. As you can see here, this is the glucose level, this is the time of the starting the fasting, and you can see that old mice have lower ability to, to produce glucose under fasting. If we follow it in all the in young, 76 old special stress in mice, you can easily see and they have the same ability as young white type mice. So cell six over excessive mice have the ability to, to generate more glucose under fasting. And to make long story short, if you give them lactate or glycerol that come that in the body come from the fat tissue or from the muscles, you can see that they have they can use it and generate glucose exactly like young mice. So one of the things that cell six over excessive mice is doing is maintaining the ability to preserve energy even in time when you don't have enough energy resources. So, I'll go back to the, to the question we asked before. Do all cell 6 phenotypes stem from histone deacetylase activity? And we had another question. Why does cell 6 over expression extend life? And I want to answer both of you this question in the next uh, seven or 10 minutes. So what we did next, we decided to create the cell 6 orchestra. When we said the cell 6 orchestra, we wanted to accumulate a lot of data. This is exactly what we did before, but the challenge of to 